going to make me look <laughs> Okay, I guess we'll start. The Committee on Science, Space, and Technology will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee at any time. Uh, good morning and welcome to today's hearing entitled James Webb Space Telescope Program Breach and Its Implications. Now, I'll recognize myself uh, for an opening statement. Today, we will hear from Administrator Bridenstein on NASA's plans to ensure that the James Webb Space Telescope is a success. We will also hear from Tom Young on the findings and recommendations of the JWST Independent Review Board. Tomorrow, at the second part of the hearing, Northrop Grumman's CEO, Mr. Westbush, will testify. We will learn more about why Northrop failed to deliver JWST on budget and on schedule and what can be done about it. Welcome to Jim Bridenstine, who is testifying for the first time since leaving the committee to become NASA's administrator. He began his job with our high expectations, and he has already exceeded them. Uh, Jim, that's the highest compliment I can pay you. Well, I thank uh, you. <laughs> uh, we can be confident that he is striving to tackle the program management issues NASA faces, specifically those associated with the James Webb Space Telescope. Starting in March 26, 2018, NASA began notifying this committee about the James Webb Space Telescope's cost and schedule breaches. Now that the Independent Review Board has completed its work, we should review the decades-long JWST cost overruns and schedule delays. And if members will take a look at this chart that's on the screen in front of us. Uh, this chart chronicles JWST's substantial cost growth and launch schedule delays starting with the 1996 initial projections in the lower left-hand corner all the way to the IRB's 2018 projection in the upper right corner. It is truly staggering to behold how the space telescope's cost and schedule projections went from costing the same as a space shuttle mission around half a billion dollars with an original launch date in 2007 to now becoming an, ex an expenditure exceeding $9 billion with a new launch goal in March 2021. This is 19 times the original cost and a delay of 14 years. It doesn't get much worse than that. The cost of delaying the launch again will add almost another billion dollars to the total program cost. The $8 billion uh, development cost cap set in 2012 will be exceeded by $803 million. With other program costs added in, the IRB now estimates the total cost at over $9.6 billion. The IRB also stated that technical complications and unclear reporting roles, responsibilities, and lines of communications greatly impacted the development schedule and its associated cost increases. Mr. Young will provide details during his testimony. We will discuss options going forward, such as the contractor watch list designation contained in the Bipartisan NASA Authorization Act of 2018. I support the continuation of JWST to mission completion and appreciate Administrator Bridenstine's efforts to improve contractor performance. Going forward, Congress needs to have the necessary confidence in NASA's contractors to put us on the right path at a reasonable cost. Anything short of that will undermine congressional confidence in contractors' ability to deliver on their promises. Usually when government contractors make mistakes, no one is held accountable. The mistakes just happened or were unavoidable or won't happen again. But in every case, the American people pick up the bill. We often forget there is no such thing as federal dollars. It's the American taxpayers' hard-earned money. If space exploration is going to continue to earn the public support, then contractors will have to deliver on time and on budget. If they cannot, they should be penalized. Uh, that concludes my opening statement, and the ranking member, the gentlewoman from Texas, is recognized for hers. Thank you very much. Good morning <coughs> to everyone. And Mr. Chairman, I thank you for holding this hearing on the James Webb Space Telescope Program breach and its implications. <clears throat> Excuse me. Welcome to our witnesses, to the Administrator Bridenstine and Mr. Young. We appreciate your commitment to this high priority science mission. 
as a powerful observatory that will be a hundred times more sensitive than the Hubble Space Telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope will be a gateway to unlocking the origins of the universe. Further, like Hubble, it will also be an inspiration for our next generation of scientists, engineers, and citizens, and a symbol of American, America's leadership in space science and exploration. I appreciate the tireless commitment and dedication of NASA to its industry, international and academic partners also for their work on this project. The hardware for the mission is now complete and the observatory is undergoing integration and testing. Getting to this point has not been easy. A 2010 review of the project identified significant costs and growth, schedule growth, while subsequent re-baseline plans helped keep the program on track for many years. Today we will discuss another series of setbacks. I want to commend NASA for establishing the Independent Review Board. The Independent Review Board, and I want to recognize the members for contributing their time and expertise, and Mr. Young for his leadership in chairing uh, the effort. The message is clear. Mission success for the James Webb Space Telescope needs to be the priority and finding potential embedded problems and minimizing the impact of human errors must be a focus going forward. That said, the Independent Review Board was also clear on the fact that both NASA and the prime contractor for the mission, Northrop Grumman, have contributed to the 29-month schedule delay and the $1 billion cost increase to the project. In particular, the review board found complex and confusing management reporting on the project and inconsistent, uncoordinated communications on the James Webb Space Telescope within NASA and with external stakeholders, including Congress. This is not good news, especially since some of these problems were identified in the 2010 review. I hope that today's hearing will inform us on how NASA plans to ensure that these and the other findings and recommendations of the Independent Review Board are successfully implemented and how lasting processes are being put in place to prevent these problems from occurring on other NASA projects. I am also concerned about the potential collateral damage. I am eager to hear from the administrator on how NASA plans to ensure the health and balance of the astrophysics program, including small missions, research, and analysis, and the next high priority decadal survey mission, <coughs> excuse me, the W first, given the additional resources that will be needed to complete the James Webb Space Telescope. And as I've said on many occasions before, inspiring and challenging projects such as the James Webb Space uh, Telescope are an investment in our future. And the review board found that it is an observatory with incredible capacity and awesome scientific potential. And while it is up to this committee to carry out the oversight of the taxpayer's significant investment in this project, we must not lose sight of the importance of bringing the James Webb Space Telescope to a successful outcome. And Mr. Chairman, I have a letter I'd like to submit for the record. Okay. It's a letter of support of the project from the American Astronomical Society. Without objection, the letter from the American Astronomical Society will be made a part of the record. Thank you very much. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Ms. Johnson. And the gentleman from Texas, the chairman of the Space Subcommittee, is recognized for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, witnesses, uh, expert. Uh, witnesses for being here as well. Uh, as chairman of the Space Subcommittee and proud representative of Johnson Space Center, I'm a very tireless advocate for NASA. I strongly believe in the mission of NASA, and I commend the tremendous dedication uh, of the NASA and industry team under Mr. Bridenstine and uh, the rest of the team. Uh, however, as members of this committee, we have a responsibility to every taxpayer 
to ensure that government agencies, including NASA, are being good stewards and effective man at managing our resources uh, with which they are entrusted. Today's hearing will focus on the serious issues associated with the James Webb Space Telescope uh, program breach and its implications, the independent review boards, analysis and recommendations, and the coming debate over congressional reauthorization of JWST. Chairman Smith summarized the IRB's findings and recommendations. So I want to use this opportunity to d discuss NASA's lost opportunities uh, due to flagship program cost overruns. As the Space Subcommittee Chairman, I focus on the NASA budget uh, in its entirety in every project and program in the agency's portfolio, particularly those where budget limitations force difficult decisions on reducing specific project budgets or whether we can even fund them at all. Please give your attention to the chart on display. The committee surveyed NASA's science portfolio over the last few fiscal years to identify project budget reductions and unfunded requests due to limitations. These projects are listed by fiscal year, starting on the left there with fiscal year 13 all the way up through fiscal year 19. You can see those. Now, with the fiscal year 18 coming to a close shortly and the IRB's announced JWST cap breach of $803 million in development costs, this chart, the next one, uh, reflects the reality of the breach going into uh, FY19 uh, budget planning. In terms of lost opportunities and NASA's budgetary trade space, it is important to know the full impact of JWST breach caused for Na that the breach caused for NASA and the American public as a whole. So we'll bring up the next one. The $803 million needed to fund the JWST cost breach could fund nearly every one of NASA's science funding shortfalls from FY13 all the way up through FY16. These projects include earth science and education projects greatly promoted by our Democratic colleagues on the committee. And looking forward to FY19 and NASA's future flagship program plans, the cost issues with the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope, or WFIRST, will become a subject of debate right alongside JWST congressional reauthorization. The FY18 omnibus required an updated life cycle cost estimate for WFIRST and NASA's report concludes the estimated cost range is $3.3 billion to $3.9 billion. This life cycle cost estimate exceeds the NASA-imposed cost cap of $3.2 billion, included in the bipartisan NASA Authorization Act of 2018. To give perspective to the uh, funding dilemma presented by JWST and WFIRST cost issues, NASA's first, a W first estimate includes a request for $371 million, which is now reflected on the FY19 chart. Thank you. The Bipartisan NASA Authorization Act of 2018 seeks to limit flagship program overlap to reduce uh, NASA's risk of becoming overwhelmed by W first development before JWST is operational in space. Thus, it is my hope the IRB report and our witness panel testimony will shed some light on lessons learned with JWST and lead to a successful flight and operations in March of 2021. We do not want these mistakes repeated during the development of WFIRST. Congress needs to understand the unvarnished truth of the status of these programs today, as well as the plan going forward. Decisions made now uh, can have long-lasting implications on future missions. We need to know that there is not a systematic or a fundamental management problem with how NASA plans and executes these larger strategic missions. And I want to thank the witnesses here today, uh, helping us to better understand where we are and how we plan to move forward. And I look forward to your testimony. And I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Babin. Yes, sir. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Barra, the ranking member of the Space Subcommittee, is recognized for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the ranking member for holding this hearing. 
in many ways, um, these hearings are a continuation of hearings that the Space Subcommittee had last month on NASA costs and schedule overruns. And it's always good to see our former colleague, Administrator Bridenstine, on that side of the, the, the podium. Yeah, I, th I won't reiterate what both the, the chairman and ranking member and chairman of the subcommittee have, have gone through, but I, I do think what um, the cost overruns suggest and remind us is the complexity of, of budgeting when you're thinking about doing something that you've never done, the, the scientific and technologic complexity. Um, and, you know, it, it, and it also highlights the important role that, that Congress has at, in our oversight role and making sure that as we're budgeting and, and, and thinking about those future priorities, we're doing so with the, the most accurate information. You know, as we think about, you know, I, I'm someone, I think, along with a lot of my colleagues, that puts a lot of faith in the decadal survey and, you know, in an objective way, kind of laying out what our priorities are. And, you know, in, in that decadal survey, um, you know, when we think about W first and, and think about future projects, in that context, um, I, I'm going to be curious to hear both today and, and, and tomorrow what we can learn in terms of if we look backwards on, on web, you know, in terms of budgeting, in terms of, you know, timeline, um, that will help inform us going forward. You know, I, I do think there will be robust dialogue and discussion as we look at future missions, future budgets and, and allocations, um, knowing that this is a pretty significant um, cost over, and this is a, you know, a billion dollars is a, a, a lot of money. Um, so it, it is what can we learn at that space subcommittee hearing. You know, we also started to talk about, you know, as, as NASA um, contracts out with other commercial vendors and others to do a lot of the important and necessary work, what are um, newer types of contracts that, you know, do share some of the risk there and, and on deliverables? You know, you use them in many other industries. Are, are those even viable in this context when you're trying to do something that you've never done before? And what does that look like? And, and I do think, you know, over th this Congress, but then also into future Congresses, it'll be important for us to have that, that conversation as, as we think about prioritizing. Um, and, and then just one, one last statement. I think it is worth noting that despite the headline-grabbing finding of schedule and cost, cost growth, the IRBs concluded that um, James Webb should continue based on its extraordinary scientific potential and critical role in maintaining US, U.S. leadership in astronomy and astrophysics. And, you know, you already have a lot of the sunk costs in there. So it would be short-sighted on our part not to say, you know, let, let's finish this incredibly important project. But again, as we go forward, It'll be interesting to, to hear from NASA as well as um, the, the, the contractors and subcontractors. What can we learn from the web experience that helps better inform us going forward as members of Congress? So thank you. And with that, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Bear. Our first witness today is Mr. Jim Bridenstine, administrator of NASA. A former colleague and member of the Science Committee and its Space Subcommittee, Mr. Bridenstine now serves as the senior space science advisor to the president and overseas agency operations. Prior to his election to Congress, Mr. Bridenstine was the director of Tulsa's Air and Space Museum. He completed a triple major at Rice University and earned his Master's of Business Administration at Cornell University. Our second witness is Mr. Tom Young, chairman of the Independent Review Board. In this role, Mr. Young led a team of 11 members to conduct a review of the JWST program. Mr. Young is the former director of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, as well as the former president and chief operating officer of Martin Marietta Corporation. He earned both a bachelor's degree in aeronautical engineering and a, and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Virginia and a master's of management degree from MIT. Uh, we welcome you both. Look forward to your testimony. And Mr. Bridenstine, if you'll begin. Thank you, Chairman Smith. It's uh, an honor to be here. Chairman Smith, Chairman Babin, Ranking Member Johnson, Ranking Member Barra, uh, thank you all for your leadership on this committee. Thank you for your leadership with the James Webb Space Telescope, quite frankly. And, uh, you know, when I was um, on your side there uh, back in March, NASA came to, came to Congress and, 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 and let everybody know that uh, we're, we're up against a, a cost overrun and, of course, uh, a, a, an increase in schedule. 
And uh, at, that, at that moment, I knew that I would be sitting on this side coming back and testifying before the committee that I used to serve on. So, so here we are, um, and I want to share with you some of the things that, that, uh, that I've learned in my time here at NASA. First of all, um, the Independent Review Board was called for by NASA at a time when we were having trouble uh, with the spacecraft element of the James Webb Space Telescope. When I say the spacecraft element, there's really two elements. One is the optical telescope element, which includes all of the scientific capabilities, and then, and then really the bus. And if you go back in time, we really believed at NASA that the most difficult part of the James Webb Space Telescope would, no kidding, be all of the scientific instruments and the capabilities on that side of, of the spacecraft. The spacecraft element um, seemed to be a little bit more routine. There's one big difference in this spacecraft element than every other spacecraft that we've ever developed, and that is that we need a sun shield. On one side of the spacecraft, we need to be down around 7 degrees Kelvin, which is near absolute zero. That's an incredibly cold temperature and necessary in order to, to use the infrared side of this telescope, which is really just it's detecting heat signatures from galaxies um, that go back to the very dawn of time, if you will, the very beginning of the universe. So in order to do that, it has to be extremely cold. So that need, we need a heat shield. And that heat shield is a very complex, very dynamic uh, piece of equipment that is unique in this particular spacecraft. Um, and it has five layers. And the, in order to deploy it, think of, a, think of five sheets the size of a tennis court stacked on top of each other. And on one side of this, of this heat shield, the temperatures are going to be almost you know, 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And on the other side, minus 390 degrees Fahrenheit, separated by maybe just a couple of feet. That's a very impressive scientific achievement once it's complete. But to deploy that heat shield is very complex and very challenging. And there's a whole lot of single points of failure. And we have to test it. And NASA was going through a process of deploying that heat shield and then folding it back for the purpose of testing. And in that process, we discovered, NASA discovered, I wasn't there at the time, but NASA discovered that this is going to take a lot longer. We were very optimistic in the amount of time that we believed that it would take to test this. Um, ultimately, that proved to be incorrect. And during the course of this, NASA said, we need to have an independent review board to, and, and I want to be really clear, nobody likes independent review boards. <laughs> they are not fun. They're not fun for NASA. They're not fun for the contractor. But NASA called for an independent review board on itself because of the delays and the cost overruns that we've had on James Webb. During the independent review board, um, there was more testing being conducted, and embedded problems were found, and some human errors were found that once again delayed it um, during the course of the independent review board. So, so that's how we came to the conclusion that we needed to really do a replanning, and that replanning has been done, and we're looking now at a launch date of March 30th of 2021, and, uh, and a cost overrun of about $800 million. So it's gone from a development cost of $8 billion to $8.8 billion, and a total life cycle cost of $8.8 billion up to $9.6 billion. These are massive increase. And I understand that. Um, it's also true, and I want to be really clear about what we're doing here. And, and Ranking Member Barra, I think, hit the nail on the head. We, we are doing things that have never been done before. And we are doing things that nobody on the face of the planet other than the United States and our European you know, supporters, the European Space Agency, has instruments on this telescope. This has never been done before in the history of the world, and it really sets the stage for who in the world is the leader in astrophysics and these kind of capabilities. And only the United States of America could accomplish this. That's where we are. I also want to be clear that we're going to, we're going to change how we understand the universe. We're going to see very, all the way back to the very beginning of the universe, what we call cosmic dawn, the very first light from the beginning of the universe. And the reason that this telescope is in infrared is because the universe is expanding all the time expanding. In fact, it's expanding at an accelerating rate. And, and, and we're trying to understand why, why is that happening. Um, but when you see back to the very beginning, Cosmic Dawn, you're talking about as the universe expands, those wavelengths lengthen. 
So instead of being able to detect optical light, we're going to be looking at infrared light. And that gives us uh, a, a requirement to have this extremely cold, cryo-cooled uh, antenna that can see back that far, basically detecting heat signatures from light uh, from the very beginning of dawn. We're also going to be able to see inside of other galaxies in ways that we've never seen before. We're going to be able to look at the atmospheres of exoplanets. This is also, I think, an important point. If you go back in time, when we started this project, we did not even know that exoplanets existed. Now we know that there are thousands of exoplanets, planets maybe even like Earth orbiting other stars in our galaxy. We're going to be able to use this telescope with a spectrometer to understand what are the atmospheres of those planets like and are they capable of hosting life. So this is a tremendous capability that we're bringing to bear that, again, nobody else on the planet can do. So I, I want to reemphasize how important this mission is and that the work that this committee has done helping us get to this point has been amazing. It's not comfortable to come back and have to testify on cost overruns and, of course, schedule delays. But at the end, uh, my, my testimony to you is that I really believe that this will be worth it. And, uh, and I look forward to answering your questions, and I appreciate um, all of you having me here today. Thank you, Mr. Bridenstine. Mr. Young. Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Johnson and committee members, I'm pleased to present the results of the Independent Review Board evaluation of the James Webb Space Telescope mission. The IRB charter established by NASA required that we evaluate all factors influencing JWST success. Our report is complete. We believe we have satisfied our charter. Our report contains 32 recommendations. We believe the implementation of all, underlining all, 32 recommendations is required to maximize the probability of JWST success. Our initial observation is that JWST is an observatory with incredible capability, awesome scientific potential, and significant complexity, risk, and first-time events. An overarching recommendation of the IRB is that mission success be the top priority in all future JWST activities. JWST is at a point in its development that every appropriate thing that can be done to maximize mission success should be done. There are a large number of JWST accomplishments that require recognition. All flight hardware has been delivered. All science instruments have been integrated into the science module, which has been combined with the telescope to form the optical telescope and science instruments instrument model called OTIS. OTIS has been successfully tested. The science instruments have met their requirements, and it has been delivered to Northrop Grumman for integration with the spacecraft and SunShield. This is but a few of the positive JWST accomplishments. In our report, we cite seven noteworthy JWST first, the most noteworthy being the SunShield, which is mandatory for success, and it has no significant legacy. There are two yet-to-be-completed phases of the JWST project that represent significant risk. The first is integration and test. To date, there have been human errors and embedded problems that have caused significant delays in integration and test, resulting in large schedule delays. The IRB has, been very, has very specific recommendations focused upon human errors and embedded problems. The success in implementing the IRB recommended corrective actions will determine the success of completing JWST development. Human errors or mistakes made by people working on the flight hardware or developing procedures that dictate how work on the flight hardware is to be conducted. Three examples of human errors that have had a major impact on JWST scheduling cost are wrong solvent used to clean propulsion valves, test wiring erroneously connected to flight hardware without adequate inspection, sun shield cover fasteners improperly installed. The capability of the integration and test workforce and the quality of procedures 
must be such that human errors are minimized, and when they occur, their impact is negligible. Embedded problems or problems in the as-built hardware that are undetected until a major test many months in the future after the problem is introduced, or even worse, not detected until the observatory is in space. The valve solvent problem and sun shield fastener problem are examples of embedded problems that have had a major impact on schedule. An in-depth audit by NASA and Northrop Grumman of the flight hardware, including drawings, procedures, etc., is required to identify any additional embedded problems that may exist. The second JWST, JWST phase with high risk is spacecraft and sun shield deployments that occur during observatory commissioning. Approximately 307 single point failure items must work to, success, to have these deployments be successful. This phase of JWST is similar to the entry descent landing phase of a Mars Science Laboratory mission, which for comparison had 72 single point failures when it landed on Mars in 2012. Both are high risk missions with no ability to test as you fly. A world class systems engineer established as EDL manager has been critical to the success of Mars landers. The IRB recommends a position of commissioning manager staff by a world class engineer be established for JWST. There are several additional technical and management recommendations from the IRB. If fully implemented, such recommendations as NASA certification on launch vehicle and management reporting and communication uh, increase the probability of mission success. The IRB recommended launch date for JWST is March 2021. This is a 29 month delay from the October 2018 date established in 2011 with a cost of approximately $1 billion. Five factors have caused this delay. Human errors, embedded problems, lack of experience in areas such as a sun shield, excessive optimism, and systems complexity. The JWST complexity and risk cannot be overstated. The IRB recommends, recommended March 2021 launch date assumes the successful implementation of the recommendations in our report. No allowance has been made for additional INT errors or embedded problems with multi-month impacts. Additional sun shield deployments during INT beyond the currently planned two or removal of a spacecraft subsystem or science instrument. With all factors considered, the members of the IRB are unanimous in recommending that JWST continue based on its extraordinary scientific potential and critical role in maintaining U.S. leadership in astronomy and astrophysics. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young, and I'll recognize myself for questions, and let me address the first one to Administrator Bridenstine. And it is this, when we take a look at the cost overruns, when we take a look at the missed deadlines in regard to JWST, what are your options when it comes to contractor accountability uh, for this particular mission as well as for others? So for this particular contract, uh, it's, it's cost plus an award fee. And the award fee is, is the, the profit, because uh, other than that, uh, the contractor is working at cost. The award fee is based on a set of metrics that NASA determines. Uh, technical capability is included in that. Cost, schedule, business administration is included in that. And, and during the course of evaluating the contractor, we're making determinations as to what their award fee will be. So a couple of things here. Number one, their award fee has not been as good as it otherwise would have been, so that has, in essence, hurt their bottom line. And number two, when there's a cost overrun or a schedule delay, as, as we have right now, there is no award fee. So they are, in essence, working right now at cost. Okay. Um, now, ultimately, uh, as, as has been identified, there's going to be a commissioning process of the satellite once it's in space. And there are potential award fees in that. Um, those potential award fees add up to, if they were to maximize it, it would add up to about $60 million. 
we have already taken off the table 28 million of that 60 million dollars, which again is not helpful to the contractor um, and hurts their bottom line. Um, it is also true um, that the remainder, 30 million plus available, they're going to have to perform in order to accomplish and, and achieve that award fee, which is again their only their only profit. Okay. Um, it, it is also true that there are provisions in the contract to actually claw back previously earned award fees. Um, and I want to be really clear, Mr. Chairman, we don't want any of that to happen going forward. We want success going forward, which means that the punishment they have already received would be the punishment they will receive. That doesn't guarantee that's how it's going to be going forward. Right. But ultimately, we want them to be successful because if they're successful, then we are successful. And so those are some of the tools that we have in our belt. Okay, that is really helpful, all those options that you just mentioned. I appreciate that. Uh, next question is, are, is there any legislation that Congress can pass that will help you enforce uh, contractor accountability? Do you need any more authority than you already have? Uh, we, we have really good authorities that we utilize right now. Um, we, we have what's called an acquisition integrity program that's administered by the, um, the Office of the General Counsel uh, at NASA. The acquisition integrity program ultimately has a, uh, provisions by which a contractor can be suspended or can be debarred. Again, we don't like exercising those authorities, but under the federal acquisition regulations, those are tools available to us. Um, if there's a law that Congress could pass, one of the things we're doing right now is we are taking some of our best talent and we are embedding them with Northrop Grumman mm -hmm. in this process. Um, you know, it, it, NASA, it, we, we, we like to count ourselves a smart buyer. When I say that, we have, and, I, and this is absolutely true, we have really intelligent and capable and qualified people right. that we can take off of other projects and put onto this project, for example, and we are doing that right now and embedding them with the contractor. That's okay. smart buying. One of the challenges we have going forward is a lot of the talent um, is going other places because of the way we, we hire. So if we could, if you could pass one law, maybe direct hire authority could help us ultimately keep our smart buyer capabilities. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bridenstine. Mr. Young, uh, how do you think the program management at JWST compares to other programs that you've analyzed? It depends on how, how far back you're computing. It depends on how far you're going back in the program. I mean, looking at the chart that you had this morning, if you, Go back to, say, the first confirmation that I'm familiar with, where I think yeah. JWST was confirmed by NASA at $2.75 billion with a 2011 launch. You know, we the cost have increased roughly yeah. a factor of three so, since that time right. period. I was primarily talking just about the program management itself in isolation. Do you consider it to be one of the worst, one of the uh, average? How does it compare well, to of, others? I'm, I'm kind of sneaking up on that answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've got limited time, so I hope you'll sneak up okay, quickly. Okay, I'll sneak fast. Okay, yeah. so if you look at the program, it's, it's grown a factor of three and a decade. It is hard to take a program with those characteristics and conclude it's anything other than a not well-managed program, and by comparison, not a well-managed program. Okay, uh, any description as to what you think of a program that cost 19 times what was anticipated and is 14 years delayed? My description would be the same, poorly managed. Okay. Uh, and what about recommendations? Uh, f and Jim Bridenstine mentioned a couple of the options that he had, sanctions. Um, do you have any recommendations going forward for what we might do with some of those fees and some of the profit and uh, how that can be used to encourage uh, Northrop Grumman to uh, perform better? I think his comments were very good. I, I would really um, underline the fact that at this stage in the program, all of us, emphasizing all of us, need to be focused on maximize the probability of JWST being successful. So if I, I'm speaking only as an individual, but if, if I had this problem, I would take all of the available fees that currently exist, be they um, the, okay. the fee on, uh, on work to be done, be award fees that have not been awarded, be in future award fees, I'd put them all together, and I'd put them in one lump sum, and I would have the criteria for getting them the quantity and quality of data returned by JWST after its own army. So I would turn every dollar yet to be awarded into an award fee 
based on mission okay. success. Uh, that is a very good suggestion, which I endorse, and I thank you for mentioning it today. Uh, the gentlewoman from Texas, the ranking member, is recognized for her questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Administrator, you mentioned in your last statement that there were moving people and unable to control some of that movement. Could you expand a little bit on that? So uh, w there's a number of things that we are already putting into place ultimately to ensure success. Um, so we have taken some NASA uh, talent and put it on, on this project um, that, and it's not just people and bodies, it's, 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 it's capability, it's uh, people with history and um, that are highly qualified on this project embedded with Northrop Grumman. Um, we are also instituting more oversight uh, from the Goddard Space Flight Center and from, from NASA headquarters. And in fact, we have uh, created a even stronger mission assurance capability so that every screw that goes onto this spacecraft ultimately is being quality assured. Um, so we get immediate feedback if, if something is, is uh, if anybody believes something is not right. Um, we want everybody to be empowered to say stop because one of the challenges that we've had is that there are embedded problems. Some of these, some of these problems are screws that were put in the, um, in the sun shield covers going back years and we don't discover it until the integration and test. I also want to, and I think it's important for me to, to, to testify that, and, and, and I, I, I heard it from Mr. Young as well. Um, we're, we're at the integration and test phase. All of the hardware is built. Um, the, the, the software is ready to go. Uh, the, in fact, the scientific instruments um, have already been tested. Um, what we're doing now is we're integrating the scientific instruments ultimately with the spacecraft and, and, and then testing that. And that's where we're having the challenge. So I think it's important to note, that if I can give an analogy, we're on the five yard line and we're trying to punch it into the end zone. And I know that um, you know, a cost overrun and a delay is not what Congress wants to hear. Um, but at this point, given the scientific return, I, th I think it's critical that we continue to put all of our resources here to get it complete. Do you think you have the proper tools to hold Northrop Grumman accountable? I, I do at this point. Uh, it, is, it is my assessment that, that we have a contract that gives us flexibility ultimately to hold them accountable. Mr. Young, would you, would you like to comment? My comments would be similar. Um, I think we do make some observations in our report of, uh, of areas that we think could really be strengthened. One, I think, was in one of your opening statements. Um, I think it's very clear that NASA have clear lines of authority and accountability for managing this project. And our observation was that they did not exist when we were looking at them. We made a very strong recommendation in this regard that, um, that the center director of Goddard have a clear responsibility for the success of the program and the associate administrator of SMD have a clear uh, responsibility for the success of this program. Um, our observation is that's not been the practice to date. That's our recommendation. I don't know what NASA's response to that is, but accountability clear lines of responsibility and authority to proceed are critical to managing a program such as JWST. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would just uh, piggyback on that and say that we, we are in fact implementing that recommendation um, of the IRB and certainly it will make a difference. And by the way, uh, Tom Young you know, used to be the director of the Goddard Space Flight Center so he knows a thing or two about the organizational structure. <laughs> so. Well, let me thank you both and, and, and kind of review that this is the first time we've ever done something like this. It's a big project and it's an important project and I would hope and I believe that both of you will continue to, well, your, your responsibility, Mr. Young, is over, but I hope you keep a little eye going too. And thanks to, thanks to both of you, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Ms. Johnson. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Babin, is recognized for his questions. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, my first question is for uh, Administrator Bradenstein. 
<clears throat> the AWST program cost issues pose a budgetary threat to the other NASA science mission programs, especially W first, uh, pro the W first program. What is your assessment of the budget planning challenges for NASA science mission programs in light of the latest JWST cost overruns? Uh, that's that's a, a wonderful question, Chairman, and it's something that um, that that we think about and we worry about because you're absolutely right. Um, this cost overrun is, is gonna be a challenge going forward. Um, so I'd like to start by saying that uh, right now we have a very balanced portfolio for astrophysics that includes small missions that are not very expensive, medium missions that are a little more expensive, and then we have these, as you mentioned, flagship missions that are strategic in nature, take a long time and very expensive, but ultimately make the United States of America the, the premier country when it comes to these kind of scientific capabilities, which we all like and believe in. When we do these massive flagship missions, as you just identified, and there are overruns and there are delays, it absolutely makes us, in essence, cannibalize some of the other missions in the future. Uh, you mentioned W first. The idea of W first presumed that JWST would be on orbit and delivering science. And so it is, it is my recommendation that you know, we move forward with, J, with w, w first um, after we move forward with JWST. Um, I think that's, now it, it is true that we can do some development now. I'm not saying that we need to shut down W first and we shouldn't do it. Right. What I'm saying is there's, there's opportunity here because it presumed JWST would be on orbit. It is also true that as we go forward with this balanced portfolio to make sure that we are getting the best science that we can get in astrophysics and throughout the entire science mission directorate, uh, we want to follow what um, Ranking Member Barra mentioned, which is the decadal surveys that come from the National Academies of Sciences. So that gives us kind of a, uh, our guidance, if you will, to make sure that we're not damaging um, our total portfolio uh, to deliver the absolute best science. So. Uh, I, I will, this is important too, uh, Mr. Chairman. The goal, when you think about 2019, uh, we, we have, um, we ha there, there is some money that is left over from last year, plus um, the, the, you know, the, um, th at this point, JWST was intended to be in operation. So we have the operational money that we can apply to uh, the development of JWST. So for 2019, it doesn't look like we're gonna need any more money. The first time that we're going to need more money is going to be 2020. Right. And that's when we're going to have to look at ultimately uh, how do we balance this portfolio to make sure we get the mix right. And our reauthorization bill actually specifies that uh, uh, before W first is, is complete, we've got to have uh, JWST on orbit. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, for both of you, uh, gentlemen, uh, the Trump administration has included space as part of the national security strategy. Do you think that JWST development issues signal an erosion in the quality of the American space industrial base to our near peer adversaries, thus negatively affecting our national security <coughs> strategy? And are JWST problems signs of more serious problems with our space industrial base? So we, we, there is a study underway right now that, that, is, uh, that is considering that as an issue. I don't want to prejudge that study. Um, but I, I will tell you the industrial base is something that is critically important to the national security interests of this country. Um, and NASA plays a role there. Um, our scientific capabilities ultimately are for, for peaceful purposes. I mean, that's just the reality. We do discovery. We do exploration. We do science. That's what NASA is. That's what NASA does. We inspire and we educate. Um, and, and so we don't get involved in national security directly. It is absolutely true, though, that what we do does help the industrial base, and the technologies, in many cases, can be used both for science um, and for national security. So th I don't want to prejudge the study, but certainly NASA plays a role here. Okay. And Mr. Young. My general observation is that the industrial base is strong. Um, I think that the problems that we're talking about on JWST uh, are problems that we know how to solve. I mean, they're, they're not failures of F equals MA or, or what have you. So it, it is, space is a one strike in your own business. 
you don't get two swings at, uh, at it. And what that really says is it takes extraordinary discipline. It takes extraordinary training of the people. And it takes a, um, a safety net that prevents a problem when it occurs because humans are going to make errors from that problem becoming mission catastrophic. We know how to do that. The disappointing thing in what we're talking about here, to be honest, is these are problems that we know how to, uh, to, to prevent. So my observation would be, yes, we should learn from JWST that every day in a one strike in your business, you've got to renew your uh, focus on discipline. But it's certainly that we know how to do, can do, and it will be a positive factor not only for the civil space program, but also for national security space. Thank you very much. I wish I had 10 more minutes, Mr. Chairman, but I don't. So I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Babin. The gentleman from California, Mr. Bear, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, as I said in my opening statement, you know, when you're looking at budgeting, et cetera, it's complicated, particularly when you're doing budgeting for something that you haven't done. Um, I'm a simple person. I think about it in the context of, you know, my daughter going off to college and she's going to start her senior year. And we made a contract saying you're going to finish in four years. And she she assures me she is going to finish in four years. But but I don't I don't I'm, I'm, well, we won't have this conversation at a committee hearing if she comes back at the the end of that fourth year and says you know I've got a couple of units that I had it's not won't be a comfortable conversation. And Administrator Bridenstine, I know this isn't a comfortable conversation. Um, and I, I think everyone understands that, given the scientific importance of J, J, JWST, given um, the sunk costs that we already have in this and the additional costs, um, it doesn't make any sense not to complete this 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 mission and you know and, and do it in a way that you know m optimizes success. I mean, it would be a, a real shame if we stop this mission, it would be an even bigger shame if we continued and I think Mr. Young, you said 307 single point failure areas, um, which suggests how complicated this is that we went through to, to finish and we got 306 right and we didn't get the 307th right. So um, yeah, I, I, I don't sense that Congress or the committee will say put a halt on, on, on this. But it doesn't mitigate what we think about going forward, right? I mean, I think you know a lot of us understand the the scientific importance of W first, et cetera. It does make it harder for this body in um, fiscally austere times when we're thinking about a lot of budget considerations, not just in the area of NASA, but obviously throughout the entire federal budget as we authorize and, and allocate funds go, going forward. And I think in that context, Mr. Young, um, through the, the IRB process, uh, um, I'd be curious about hearing some of what we've learned looking backwards that will help this body in its oversight role make better decisions going, going forward. Does that make sense? And I'd, you know. Sure, good, good question. Um, I think that um, you can certainly look at JWST, but you can also look at W First. I think what NASA did recently on W First was they did an in-depth uh, review of the of the W First program to look at requirements, cost, budget, uh, all the factors, and they did it at a time where there's total flexibility. In other words, for W First today, everything is controllable. In other words, you can make every decision that you want on the program. You can adjust the requirements uh, to go with the cost, to go with the schedule, to go with the technical risk. And, and that's, that, now what it also requires is after you get all those data, if you allow me to say so, it requires leadership to utilize those data uh, to turn them into a credible program. But I think that it should become common practice for programs uh, flagship missions, not only for astronomy and astrophysics, but across the board, to prior to entering into real development, to take the time to really look at all the trade space and to make in, intelligent decisions as to how, how far you want to push the technology, 
how far you want to push the requirements and what's affordable and what is a reasonable schedule in the process. I actually think that's an extraordinarily powerful tool that can eliminate some of the issues that we're talking about now with future programs starting with W first. So as, as I, I guess maybe this is for about, uh, Administrator Bridenstine, as we start to look forward, certainly within JW, JWST, but within future programs, I think it'll be incredibly important to think about what we've learned, to think about, you know, the, there's obviously scientific and technological risks of the unexpected, but also if I listen to, to Mr. Young, there's the organizational decision-making, human error side of things that we ought to have a lot more control over and put the systems and processes in place, the redundancy, et cetera, that helps prevent these types of issues happening in the future. So you know, it looks like I'm out of time, but again, we can't undo the past. Let's just make sure we learn from the past and we don't repeat the same failures in, in, in the future. Thank you, Mr. Bear. The gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher, is recognized for his questions. Uh, this, of course, is very disturbing when a uh, large amount of wealth has just evaporated that we thought we had, we had planned on. And uh, when you talk about, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the real difficulty of the mission, you have to come to the point with this type of mission, you end up with, uh, you have to, I mean, this, the, every screw has to have its quality uh, tested, and uh, that's part of this. Well, I can tell you, this is about the, the biggest screw job I've ever seen, and it's the taxpayers getting screwed here. And uh, however, let us note when we say that and understand that, and we expect more, that this is not inconsistent with other things that we have witnessed from NASA and from the aerospace industry. Uh, uh, I, um, I remember the uh, C-17 project, and uh, uh, the C-17 was, a, what, so, I mean, a billion dollars over, uh, over budget, and they were gonna close down the whole line, and I remember, I, it was one of the first things when I came here, I remember calling my father, who was a DC-3 pilot in World War II, saying, should I vote for the money to put this C-17 back in production because they have already gone a, a, almost a billion dollars overrun and they're gonna have to start all over in, in building the line? And my dad said, well, let me ask you this. Do you think the C-17 is gonna be needed by our people who are defending our country in the future? And I said, well, yes, because we're gonna to have to project power. And thank God I thought of that. <laughs> because I said, in the future, we're gonna to have to project our power to, to areas on the other side of the world, rather than having bases everywhere. And he said, well, then you just answered your question. You need the airplane. Uh, and he said, every single plane I know, my dad was a career pilot, every single plane had cost overruns. Every single plane, he says, because they're trying to do what they haven't done before. And that's what goes with that territory when you're doing something that you've never done before. I would hope that we can be more realistic uh, and we can hope that Mr. Bridenstine and his new uh, job here can be more realistic in the, the assessments. Let's note that in 2002, uh, we awarded, uh, uh, what, uh, $824 million TRW uh, for this uh, telescope project. And uh, it was supposed to be launched uh, eight years later. And now uh, it's uh, uh, twice as long as what was expected. And the cost is 12 times more than expected for the James Webb Telescope. But when you look back, the Hubble Space Telescope was 12 times the cost and twice as long as expected as well. I think I see a trend there somewhere. And I think that uh, we need to be very serious about that. I mean, I remember uh, we had trouble with the space station as well. 
in cross reference. We've had certainly uh, with the Tubble, uh, Hubble and the C-17. Uh, let me ask, ask you, uh, uh, Mr. Young, are people bidding, is one of the problems is that these professionals that we rely on in the aerospace industry, are they bidding and saying they can do something before they know they can do it? Or, uh, you see, it's one thing to say, I think we, you know, we believe we can do this, but are they basing a lot of their uh, bids on maybe something that they don't know they can do, but they think they can? Is that one of the problems? If you take JVST, uh, the, the bidding was, you know, a long time ago, as you, said, as you point out, was in 02. And NASA, we've, we've come a long way since 02 in our understanding as to how to cost these projects and how to uh, establish schedule for these projects. But I think it is, it is fair to recognize that on, with cost plus programs, this is not, you're not going to enjoy this answer, but with cost plus programs, contractors fundamentally, fundamentally bid lowest credible cost. Mm. And, and it's really up to the evaluators to have a competent capability such that lowest credible doesn't win. So, so there is a situation that exists, but, but that's the status that existed then and probably you know, still to a degree exists today. But uh, w as long as lowest credible cost wins, lowest credible cost will be bid. Hmm. And can we change that? Is, it, is, there, is, there, is there an alternative to that? Sure, there's an alternative, and that is uh, the, um, how smart the buyer is to be able to establish what the realistic costs are and to punish in the bidding process bidding unrealistically low cost. Well, when we uh, try to analyze what the cost of a screw job is going to be, uh, I hope that we understand that that's what's the cost of the American people if we aren't uh, handling that in a professional way. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rohrbacher. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Lipinski, is recognized. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good to have uh, you back, uh, Mr. Uh, Bridenstine. It, uh, thank you for your... Uh, your work there at NASA, uh, this is obviously a um, um, critical, uh, critical program. Uh, the impact that this is going to have on uh, astrophysics and for, you know, we've talked a little bit about what, what that means in terms of searching for, for life, seeing the beginning of, of, of the universe. Uh, the, the impact is very hard to... Uh, really for everyone to understand. I think one of the uh, issues that we have here in this committee, in Congress in general, is trying to understand uh, the technology, understand how we can get, do our, the best job we can do to get the best science uh, at the you know with, without the the cost overruns without without the delays, uh, but lacking the expertise, we have a difficult time with that. We've discussed a lot of things. Um, uh, you and uh, Mr. Young have just uh, discussed a lot of things that went wrong in with the uh, JWST and some things that could be changed going forward. So I want to ask you, you, uh, Mr. Ed Bridenstine, do you? believe that uh, going forward that uh, lessons learned really can be applied here because it seems there's a, there, there's a lot of things that, that we're talking about and some of them you know taking more time I mean that's going to be more more time and in, in, in more cost you know figuring these things out uh, making sure that everything is covered making sure that everything is is checked uh, are you confident that uh, there are lessons learned and how are those lessons learned going to be, you know, implemented going going forward? And Mr. Rohrbacher brought up, you know, well, in, in Mr. Mr. Young said that uh, everyone, every one who who's bidding always under under bids. Well, do you have the ability at NASA to really get these things better under control so that you can deliver better for the American people going forward? 
all um, wonderful points, and certainly uh, the, the answer is I really believe that there are a whole host of learning points here, and that these learning points ultimately need to be distributed not only across NASA, but across government at large. And so one of the first things we're doing is we're taking the lessons learned. Um, when you think about all of the 32 recommendations from the Independent Review Board, um, we're compiling those, and we're going to um, have a road show and go to all 10 of the NASA centers um, and other facilities that NASA has, and we're going to go around and we're going to talk about ultimately what the failure was here. This is, this is an opportunity, quite frankly, to learn um, and to prevent this kind of thing from happening in other missions. A couple of things that I think are important to address um, on the, the chart we saw, you know, the $500 million original cost figure. One of the challenges NASA had going back all the way uh, to then, the, the early 2000s, was what are the requirements? What are we building here? And at the time, the telescope was going to be a, a four meter, it's going to have a four meter mirror. The primary meter, or the primary mirror was only going to be four meters large. Then it was determined, well, hold on a second. We want to see all the way back to the very beginning of the universe, the very first light. Well, that means we have to be able to detect even more trace infrared signatures that we've never been able to do before. So how do we accomplish that? Well, we have to have, you know, almost absolute zero temperatures. We have to have this massive um, heat shield um, that is very intricate with, with, with five different layers of, of Kapton sheets. So on well, one well, side... It, it, yeah. Excuse me, I just going to run out of time here. Yeah. Is there, going forward though, yes. I understand the, the complexity and the added complexity as looking for something that could do more is there a way that we can be confident here that this is not going to happen in the future? It wasn't just the added complexity. Right. Complexity was added, but then the, it, the, the cost of how much, you know, how much it was going to cost, how long it was going to take, yeah. uh, th there was not a, doesn't seem to maybe been realistic. Uh, you know. That is absolutely true. And that was a recommendation from the Independent Review Board is that we were excessively optimistic. Well, let me ask Mr. Young, are you, are you, how much confidence do you have that we're not going to be back here uh, with another uh, you know, W-first or what, any other major uh, NASA project that we're not going to be talking about these same issues again uh, after we've, we've gone through this? If I could narrow your question, if, if, and to do I believe that for JWST, we know the lessons learned in order to successfully complete this program, I, I, my belief is the answer that's yes. And what I really mean is that if the recommendations that we have made, if NASA implements them as we intended, uh, in the depth that we intended them to, then, then I believe we have maximized the probability of success JWST. A few fundamentals. We have got to, um, when human errors occur, we have got to have the processes in place that keep them from having any significant impact on schedule. And we know how to do that. The other item, which is harder, is the embedded problems. There have been two. Are there any more embedded problems? And if they are, we have got to find them before we get to the test so that we can, can eliminate them. Now, that is a hard item. That will take tens of people months to go through. Fundamentally, what you're doing is you are reestablishing the pedigree for each piece of hardware that you are confident. So it's, so it's more time it's going to take. Yeah. Yeah, it, it could. It and, and, we, could, and we have to understand it's that. Possible we have it to be accepting of that. It's possible. That's possible. I actually think that the schedule has been established with the reservations that I, or with the footnotes that I put on it in my comments is a realistic uh, schedule. But the program is really at a point right now that you, there's really, the, the control parameters are small. And that is, uh, you really have a choice between cost and schedule and risk. I mean, that's what, you're, that's what the program is managing from, from this day forward. And if you try to go too fast with too little cost, then you're probably gonna add risk. And it, it doesn't mean that you don't have to be prudent because in how you manage the risk, but you're really trading risk, schedule, and cost 
every day is what the project people will be doing from this day forward for JWST. Well, I think the science is so important that we, no question that we need to move forward. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Lipinski. The gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Brooks, recognized. Good to see you here, uh, Mr. Bridenstine. Uh, Thank you. Missed some of our uh, witty conversations during votes on the House floor. You bet. You've not been replaced, but we're looking. <laughs> All right. Um, per the testimony, the James Webb Space Telescope delay cost taxpayers roughly $800 million. With the limited resources of the NASA budget, I'm concerned that other space priorities will have their funding impacted by these cost overruns. And that concern has been heightened by your testimony that these cost overruns uh, may force NASA to, quote, cannibalize other missions, uh, end quote. Uh, with that as a backdrop, will you commit here today that these James Webb Space Telescope cost overruns will not come from the space and human exploration or, more specifically, the space launch system portions of the budget? So there, at this point, that, that hasn't even been discussed. So this is, uh, this is relevant to the Science Mission Directorate exclusively, and that's where, um, at this point, we've had discussions about, um, you know, what are the options going forward. What is the timetable for NASA's determination of what programs will be cannibalized to come up with that now $800 million shortfall? So um, maybe the word cannibalized isn't the right word, but the idea is there is an opportunity cost going forward. What missions maybe we, do we not start um, and, and, and that kind of thing. So um, the answer is uh, by the 2021, or actually by the 2020 um, time frame is when we're going to need uh, to have additional funds. And so between now and then, we're going to have to make determinations. And, you know, that process is right Right now, it's, it's underway, and in this, in this process, what we're trying to do is, again, evaluate where we are with respect to uh, the decadal surveys for each of the divisions of the Science Mission Directorate, make sure that we're in compliance with that, and ultimately uh, uh, do it in a way that people can agree on. And, and I'd love to have your feedback on that. Well, as a member of the Space Subcommittee, and also as a member of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, you can imagine how each of us on this committee uh, focus on different parts of what NASA does for our country. And I suspect that each of us has some concern about whether things that we believe are most important may be delayed as a result of these James Webb Space Telescope cost overruns. So if you could please keep us informed as you engage in your decision-making process, uh, I would very much appreciate it, and I'd submit that the committee as a whole would also do so. You can count on it. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Right. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. And the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byers, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Mr. Bridenstein, uh, welcome back. Thank you. You know, how much has changed since 1996? Oh my when, when this was first put out there at half a billion dollars. And, and I'm, I'm just thinking about so many projects that we've seen over the years where there's been actually evolution in design, what we expected the project to do, the kind of instruments that were on board. I, I, I love that you brought up the search for the cosmic dawn and looking back into that. Can you even talk about how much cosmology has changed, the science itself in those 22 years, and what impact has that had on the delays and the cost? Uh, it's, it's a wonderful question. And when you think of the universe at large, uh, we're, NASA is learning new things every single day. Um, how, how the universe is expanding, and not just expanding, but expanding at an ever-increasing rate. It's actually accelerating. And, and, and what is causing that? And um, can James Webb help us understand that you know, at the edge of the universe, there are galaxies, in essence, disappearing because they're accelerating faster than the speed of light. So those galaxies, the light from them, if they're faster than the speed of light, that light can't get back to Earth, which means um, there's, a, there's a whole lot of things we don't understand about the physics, astrophysics, that this particular spacecraft is going to help us learn. Going back to the very beginning of Cosmic Dawn, we're going to learn how did the very first galaxies form? What did that first light look like? What was its shape? What was its pattern? Um, and, and, and we have models at NASA that we believe could be accurate 
but I'm telling you they're not because we don't know. Uh, we, we talk about things like um, dark matter and uh, dark energy, things that we have very little understanding of. We cannot interact with it in any way. We cannot sense it. We cannot detect it. But we, there's evidence of it based on how objects move in space. There's evidence of gravitational effects of it. Um, and so, uh, and, and all of these things, you talk about gravitational waves, things that, you know, just recently we have been able to detect. Um, you know, so all of these kind of, you know, new things that uh, didn't exist, you know, even a few years ago, and I, earlier I mentioned exoplanets. The idea that exoplanets existed um, is, 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 I mean, the idea that they existed is not new, but we had no evidence of it until, you know, within the last 10 years, and now every day we're detecting new exoplanets, and now there's thousands of exoplanets right near our own our own uh, star, and the question is, um, you know, can can this help us understand the atmospheric composition of those planets that are around other stars, um, and and uh, help us understand whether or not life could exist there? So, well, there I, I really want to thank you for the comprehensiveness of that answer because I think you point out very clearly that this isn't simply um, mismanagement or cost overruns or delay. It's the fact that the world and science itself is changing yeah. in ways that impact a project that we have completely different expectations for in 2018 than we had in 1996. <coughs> That's so, let, so let me ask you another completely speculative question, but she did so well on that one. $9.6 billion is what we're going to spend. Um, what will be the value of the knowledge that we get compared to that $9.6 billion? So uh, again, we don't know what we don't know until this spacecraft is operational. I want to be clear. We're doing everything we can to make it operational. But when it becomes operational, it's going to change our understanding, really, of, of, of astrophysics, change our understanding of the, the universe and, and, and even galaxies and, and their formation, and the formation of planets. Um, so, so all of this is going to add tremendous value. But I would also argue, and I really believe this, that the United States of America may have lost some ground when it comes to science and astrophysics on the international scene. What this spacecraft represents is the reestablishment of the United States of America as the preeminent nation when it comes to astrophysics and science. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I think that's an important part of our leadership in the world. Um, and ultimately, other countries all around the world are coming up with ideas on how to use this spacecraft. And they want access to it. Um, countries that you wouldn't normally think of, uh, that, and, and, and universities that um, have great astrophysicists that want to have access to this. And they're, they're sending NASA ideas all the time on how to use this. So th there's a whole host of capabilities that we can't even predict yet until, until, it's, until it's on orbit. And we're doing everything we can to get there. Mr. Chairman, I just wish we had a head of NASA that was excited about this project. Yeah. <laughs> well, when you ask your first question, I could see that answer going on for a couple of hours, but I thought it was a good answer. Um, and uh, thank you, Mr. Beyer. We will now go to the gentleman from California, I believe, Mr. Knight. He's recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, was, um, I had the honor of having the new administrator in our new NASA caucus last night. He spoke about all of the great things that NASA is doing, um, you know, and we brought up uh, what New Horizons did and how that was a kind of a mankind changing event. It was on every newspaper across the globe. This wasn't a national issue. This was in a total globe issue. Uh, when we went by Pluto and we were able to go within 10,000 miles of Pluto's surface and, and do all of the, the things that uh, New Horizons brought to us. But I'd like to kind of look at what we've done in progression with Hubble and even closer to home uh, with Sophia and some of the other telescopes that we use uh, and what we see and what we get. And give me an idea, and I, I think you've, you've expounded on this quite a bit, but how much of a game-changing event is James Webb going to be uh, um, yeah. compared to what Hubble gives us that's uh, 350 miles away from us? Uh, and James Webb being uh, almost a million miles away from us and, uh, and cruising? It's a, a, a wonderful question, and um, I've heard Chairman Smith talk about Hubble a lot in my days on this committee and his excitement for it, and I'll tell you the story he tells um, and how Hubble absolutely changed the game of what we understand about our, our universe. 
Um, the way Chairman Spitz describes it, um, if you hold a penny up at arm's length and you look at the eye of Abraham Lincoln, um, when Hubble looks through that eye, which is a very small piece of sky, just that, that, that's all the piece of sky that it's looking at, but in an area of, 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 of space where there's not a lot of stars in our own galaxy so we could see beyond our galaxy, um, Hubble started taking pictures in areas like that. And instead of seeing stars, Hubble saw thousands and thousands of galaxies. So we now believe that there are potentially 400 billion plus galaxies, each with 400 billion plus stars, and I'm just throwing out round numbers here, that every galaxy is very different. We won't hold you to those numbers. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> But it, it changed the way we understand our place in the cosmos and ultimately um, how complex our, our cosmos is. And Hubble changed, changed the game. It changed textbooks. You know, the, we didn't grow up with that knowledge. Now we have that knowledge, and it's, it's in the textbooks that my kids are reading. Um, James Webb is going to do the same thing for our understanding of how, you know, physics in the early uh, universe worked because there's a lot of things we don't know. Um, and so it will, it will change textbooks. It will be generational, just like Hubble was. Uh, and it's a, it's a whole new level of understanding that, um, that we're going to have to have as a, as, a, as a nation and as humanity. And, and absolutely. And I, and I think these, these um, I appreciate the chairman doing this. This is very important. It, it's important for us as representatives to know uh, what is the cost overrun? What is a time overrun? Uh, what are the, the difficulties? And is this something that we, uh, we saw when we started out on this? A lot of times government asks for something that uh, we might not know how to do, but over a period of time we're going to learn that. Uh, and that's something that maybe we've got to get a little better at too. This is an extremely difficult uh, issue. Uh, and this is something that is going in a different direction. But as I like to say, America takes giant leaps where others uh, thought was impossible. And that's exactly what we're doing with James Webb. Um, so I, I think that everyone has said, keep it on time now, move forward. Uh, let's get this um, in the air so that our academics, our kids, who are going to learn from this, and scientists around the world are going to learn. Um, that is what we are going to impact. This is a human kind event. Um, this is not something that's easy, and uh, uh, this is not something that we're not going to have more problems, but um, when this happens, this will be a human kind event. So I appreciate your leadership. I appreciate the enthusiasm. Um, that's what NASA is about. It's achieving. It's making sure that that seven-year-old that uh, wants to be uh, an aeronautical engineer or an astronaut or whatever looks at NASA and says, look at all they're achieving. That's what I want to do. And it changes the globe for the better. So thank you. And Mr. Knight, I would add that we're making great progress on the low boom flight demonstrator. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Knight. And thank you, Mr. Bridenstine, for that great description of the deep field view taken <laughs> there by you go. the Hubble Space Telescope. I've actually passed out over a thousand eight by eleven glossies of that deep field view, that, that right? speck of sky where you described where nothing was thought to exist. Uh, the, the film was exposed for 24 hours, and in that speck there were 3,000 points of light, each not a star, but each a galaxy consisting of an average of 100 million stars. If anyone wants to know why we explore, take a look at that deep field view. Uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Lamb, is recognized for his question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Bridenstine, you use the term uh, reestablishment of the United States as a the leader in astrophysics. Um, could you just go a little further with that? Do you feel that we've lost ground in recent times, and, and what would be the reason for that? I don't. I don't know that I would say. Well, I I would say um, that others have gained ground. How about that? And, and there are other countries around the world that are developing capabilities all the time. The European Space Agency is doing wonderful work. China is, in fact, um, establishing a pretty impressive astrophysics capability. Um, and so I wouldn't say we've lost ground. I'd say others have gained ground. We welcome that. <laughs> knowledge is knowledge, and we want them to be successful. In this particular case, um, this is going to gain new ground for the United States of America. And I think it's important that we always strive 
um, to do more because when we do more, then they're going to do more. And ultimately, um, our knowledge, especially from James Webb, from Hubble, these capabilities, what the data that we get from it, the information, the scientific act, it's available to the world. Um, and scientists can actually use the data to make discoveries that NASA doesn't uh, have the capacity to make on its own. And so when we make it available, a lot of people find new things that we didn't ourselves even discover, and, and, uh, and, and so it's good for the entire world. Absolutely. Um, do you, so I think that's an important point that the, the funding discussion behind this, both for James Webb and for NASA overall, um, isn't taking place in a vacuum. China, you mentioned, is making significant investments in astrophysics, and I think we know that in their space program, they're going it alone in some areas, um, you know, suggesting that there is a, a bit of competition going on. Um, is that something that you think should influence the discussion of the NASA budget and the decisions we make in 2020 when there is, you know, a projected shortfall because of these overruns? Uh, Absolutely. I mean, I, I do believe that, um, you know, NASA is an agency that can establish American leadership that, uh, that ultimately um, the NASA budget always returns far more than the investment. And, um, and I can give example after example. We, um, we actually promote the fact that we, you know, we have a spinoff Twitter feed, NASA spinoff. <laughs> so go to at NASA spinoff and you'll find all kinds of capabilities that have de been developed. What NASA does, we make available to the world, and then people use it for all sorts of, all sorts of things that are, that are good. But the humanity itself, the way we communicate, the way we navigate, we, you probably may have had direct TV or dish network, maybe internet broadband from space, um, the, you know, using GPS, the way we predict weather, the way we um, understand the climate, uh, certainly the way we do national security and defense, disaster relief, um, simple things that we don't normally think about, like banking requires the GPS signal. Banking is fundamental to the United States of America. Every transaction requires that timing signal from GPS. So um, when you think about what space represents, it, it represents a fundamental increase in, in, in the standard of living, not only for all Americans, but for the entire world. And all of those capabilities um, are available because of a trail that was blazed by NASA, these investments, if you will. Um, and so the, the answer is yes. When the United States Congress makes determinations to invest in NASA, it always strengthens the United States of America, and it always lifts um, not just our citizens, but citizens around the world uh, in ways that we never even imagined when we make the investments. So I, I do fundamentally believe that NASA is a great investment for the United States. Thank you. Um, just one more question. We have talked in this committee before about um, developing the future workforce in aerospace and astrophysics. And one of the pieces of feedback we heard was that um, NASA's sort of comparative advantage when they're competing, I guess, against private sector employers is the ability of NASA to give uh, its workers really hands-on experience on one-of-a-kind projects, especially earlier in their career. Um, do you know if that's happening on James Webb? Uh, is there a younger workforce that's able to take part in this and able to get the kind of experience that they wouldn't be getting anywhere else? So that, that's a wonderful question. Um, NASA is, as you can imagine, it, it is for seven years in a row been the number one federal agency uh, as far as uh, workforce. Uh, when I say number one, the best place to work um, as determined by the workers themselves. Uh, so that, that's really an amazing capability. What that means is that NASA's workforce, we don't have a lot of turnover. In fact, it's about 4.5% per year, which means our workforce is aging, and that's, that's just the reality. So we are using authorities right now to attract a, a younger workforce, a program called the Pathways Program that helps us get interns and ultimately recent college graduates, recent graduates from master's programs, we're doing, we're doing what we can to get a younger workforce, and we are engaging them absolutely in projects. In fact, right now this summer, we have over 1,600 students interning at NASA. And a lot of those interns, you know, they're, I'll tell you, most of them want to work for NASA. There's not going to be spots for all of them to work at NASA. But they're probably going to work in, the, in, the, in a related field or for a contractor or something like that. So the answer is yes, we're doing what we can. The workforce is, in fact, aging. There is a bow wave that I am very concerned about because eventually there's going to be a lot of retirements coming. 
Uh, we've got to be very cognizant of that and preparing for it today. Uh, and of course, I, and it's my belief that NASA is doing what it can to make sure that we're prepared for that bow wave. Um, but but the, the workforce is aging. You're, you're making a great point. We're doing what we can to make it younger. Thank you, Mr. You Chairman. Bet. I yield. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Holtgren, is recognized for his question. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you both uh, for being here. Uh, and uh, this is an important hearing as we continue our oversight of the James Webb Space Telescope and review recent problems that we've had. Back in uh, hearing in 2011 on the issues with the telescope, I, I talked about my thoughts of the importance of American leadership in these fields and how this really is part of who we are as a nation and the fact that we continue to be an exceptional nation. It's important to acknowledge that we've had some very serious uh, issues with project management over the life of this program. But we also have to remind ourselves that we're almost over the finish line and, and this is truly where we all do want to be. Many people looked at that 2011 replan as the last chance. So obviously is not what we want to see. Uh, Administrator Bridenstine, thank you for your work. Uh, it's so good to see you back here and especially in the role that you're in. So uh, congratulations and thanks for your work. Uh, also, it was good to see you last night and again, want to commend you on the vision that you're bringing to NASA and uh, the direction that the President and the administration has uh, charged you with and NASA with. It's exciting and you can just feel the excitement uh, that uh, so many are sharing with that. You know about my views on these world leading projects. I've always been so proud of NASA's ability to inspire and bring others uh, along with. Uh, this is certainly from young children uh, that you inspire in STEM to also our foreign partners on ISS or other ESA projects. I wondered if you could discuss some other projects that NASA is working on or planning and how the capabilities of James Webb are necessary for them to get the best science. In short, how many other investments are we making that rely on this initial investment and what else do we have to lose if this does not go up? Uh, so James Webb, um, it, when you think of the, the astrophysics division of the science mission directorate, uh, James Webb is one piece. And there are other missions out there that can help us ultimately, uh, that, that are less expensive, less capable, um, but ultimately can help us determine how to best use James Webb um, as a force multiplier, if you will. So it is absolutely true that um, we think of it as a system of systems and that um, some of the smaller missions inform how we want to use the, the flagship missions. Th that being said, um, we, we have to get this right. Um, as, as Tom Young mentioned, uh, there's over 300 parts that are single points of failure, which is why we are testing it and retesting it and testing it some more to make sure that it, that it works. And every single one of these, I want to be clear about this too. Um, single, 300 single points of failure is a lot. That's not what NASA normally does. NASA does normally have projects that have a lot of single points of failure. The Curiosity rover that landed on Mars had over 70 single points of failure. Um, it's a successful mission, overwhelmingly successful. We are discovering right now um, that you know, there are um, uh, complex organic compounds on Mars, which has never been determined before, and now we're finding them, which increases the probability of life. Um, methane, of course, cycles are now, we now know that methane cycles are are commensurate with the seasons on Mars. And in fact, um, you know, today you're going to probably see reports that we have found what appears to be liquid water about one and, a, one and a half kilometers below the surface of Mars. Amazing. That wasn't from Curiosity. That's from another uh, satellite mission around Mars that, that has, uh, you know, a radar. So, so but, but these, are the, these are capabilities that, um, that we make investments in. They have single points of failure. This one's more complex. There's more single points of failure. We have to be more diligent about every aspect. It's why we're putting so much effort into mission assurance and other things. Um, but it, it, is, it is a force multiplier, as you're acknowledging, yeah. that um, the other missions that we do are excellent. Uh, this actually makes them even better. Me, it, ma it, makes, it makes those investments even better. It's really helpful. Let me get on to one last quick question in my yes, last sir. minute here. Uh, Administrator, you brought up uh, this a little bit last night, but I think it would be good uh, to get it on the record. And this is also something that I had asked former NASA Administrator Griffin, uh, and it's something that worries me as we work with other nations on world-leading science experiments. What is the first question you get from our foreign partners when you come to them 
and see how we can collaborate. I'm always worried about our budgetary process and especially CRs. Uh, but your comments last night did give me hope. Wondered uh, just for a oh. little bit, you could talk if you could talk about what you're hearing from um, yeah collaborators. Thank, thank you for bringing bringing that up. Uh, I just got back from the Farnborough Air Show. The heads of space agencies from out, throughout the world were there, and um, and we had great collaborations. I was going with a mindset that I'm going to have to make a sales pitch that our you know, we're, we're, we're going forward to the moon with a sustainable architecture so that this time we can stay and then we're going to go on to Mars. We need all of our international partners involved and more. And we need not just our international partners, but commercial partners. And I was going there to make a sales pitch. And overwhelmingly what I heard from our international partners, which we've established strong partnerships with, I think it's over 90 different countries at this point, although they weren't all at this one event. Um, what I heard overwhelmingly is, tell us what we need to do. Hmm. It wasn't me trying to make a sales pitch. They're ready to go. That's great. They want direction, and then they can sell their governments, and we can move forward uh, as, as, as a body. Space represents, in my view, a, a, a very strong, soft power tool for the United States of America to establish leadership. James Webb is, is a perfect ex example of that. The European Space Agency is providing two scientific instruments. They're providing scientists that are going to be integrated with our scientists on James Webb, and they're providing the launch capability. So um, the European Space Agency has really stepped up to the plate on James Webb. They're making sacrifices the same as we're making sacrifices because they, like us, believe it will be worth it. Gentlemen's time Thank has you. expired. You'll back. Chair now recognizes a gentleman from Florida, Mr. Chris, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Administrator uh, Breitenstein and Mr. Young, for being with us today. Appreciate your time. Uh, it's a concern of mine that the repeated scheduled delays and cost overruns are putting increasing pressure on both NASA as well as Northrop Grumman uh, to prevent any, any further slippage. While it's important to keep schedule and costs under control, it's even more important, in my opinion, to make sure that we get this done right and that we don't cut any corners that could negatively impact uh, mission success. So Administrator uh, Breitenstein, how will NASA be able to guarantee that the remaining integration and test work is not affected by this scheduled pressure? It's, it's a wonderful question. Um, the, the Independent Review Board um, made uh, an assessment on both schedule and cost. Uh, NASA ran independently uh, an assessment on schedule and cost um, through our Agency Program Management Council and our um, Directorate Program Management Council. We came to, in essence, the same conclusion. Uh, we wanted to make sure that there was adequate margin for both cost and schedule so that we weren't putting ourselves up against the wall, so we do believe there's adequate margin in there. At the same time, we are incorporating all of the recommendations uh, from, from the Independent Review Board. Um, there, there are you know, two recommendations that we haven't implemented yet, but we're making progress on. Um, and so uh, I, I really believe that, that we're going to be able to accomplish the task. We've, again, we, we have taken NASA workforce and put, that, put them on this task, highly qualified NASA workforce. We have strengthened uh, the mission assurance piece, which is immediate feedback uh, and response to every, every you know, every item that goes on or off the spacecraft is being overseen by somebody who can stop the entire program immediately. Um, we are uh, providing direct oversight from the Goddard Space Flight Center, and we're providing, um, you know, direct oversight from NASA headquarters as well. Uh, so I, I do believe that, um, that we've taken uh, all, the, all the tools that we have, and we're using them to the best of our ability. And if, if we continue to execute, how we're executing right now, we will be on cost, we will be on schedule, and we will have mission success. Okay, thank you, sir. Mr. Young, would you add anything to that? Uh, I thought that the description was really quite good that, uh, that, was, ju that was just given. Mm -hmm. I think that the only thing I would underline is <clears throat> that when we do hit the, the hard spots, and there will be some, that mission success has got to be the defining criteria as to how we go forward. So I think your question is really excellent, and that is that uh, while schedule and cost are important, they're not more important than mission success. Right. And as long as we have that culture and philosophy, which I actually see existing, then I think that uh, you know we'll proceed well. But that's got to be the the, the uh, <coughs> hallmark as to how we go forward, and that's got to be communicated down 
to the law, to working levels of the organization uh, because right today while we're having this hearing my guess would be that at some at a working level somebody made a decision that probably can have a real influence on the success of, of JWST and we want to be sure that the criteria that they're making that decision against is mission success and not schedule and cost. Great. Thank you, sir. Uh, back to you, Administrator. Um, what do you believe is NASA's responsibility when human error uh, by contractors occurs, and what changes do you think might need to be made, if any, uh, for contractor oversight? So um, specifications and requirements that come from NASA ultimately um, need to be very crystal clear. There can be no mistakes as NASA generates specifications and requirements. One of the challenges we saw during acoustic testing, um, when, you, when you think about uh, the sun shield covers, you know, the sun shields have to be folded up and then, and then flown in, within a rocket fairing and then deployed once in space. The sun shield covers um, had, had fasteners that, that, that kept, them, you know, kept the sun shields covered. Those fasteners ultimately um, were, were, were um, held together by screws and bolts, and NASA did not specify what the torque specification requirements were. That's a failure of NASA. Um, should Northrop Grumman have maybe um, done things differently? Maybe, but NASA has responsibility here as well. Um, and so it's on us to, mission success is on NASA. Uh, we can blame the contractor, but the reality is it's on us to have mission success. So um, accountability is critical. We have tools in place for accountability. Uh, we are at this point at the integration and testing phase. We're on the, we're on, again, I've, I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. We're on the five-yard line trying to punch it into the end zone. Um, we're almost there. I believe we're going to get there. Um, but going forward, we have to be, and, and this is one of the takeaways that we're going to take on a road show, when we generate specifications and requirements, um, we can't miss anything because ultimately mission success is on NASA. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chris. The gentlewoman from Arizona, Ms. Lesko, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I'm the second newest member to Congress, and um, I don't know if some of my fellow congressmen are more used to these budget overruns or not, but when I read this, I was just thought it was outrageous uh, that it's 19 times over the budget that was uh, estimated and uh, so far behind uh, delayed. And I really think this is just a perfect example of why the American public doesn't trust the federal government in spending its tax dollars. I, re I really do. I just thought it was outrageous. Um, so. I guess my question, since I'm new, is what has been done since you know 2007, this was expected to be finished, has Congress or NASA done anything in between besides what's just happening now with this IRB? Um, and uh, if they did do something, obviously it didn't work. And so I, I want to know if anything has been done in the past 11 years, and, um, and if so, why should we believe it's going to change in the future? So in, in 2011, there was an independent review board. Um, and at the time, r the, all of this was still in development. Go going back even further, one of the big challenges we had is changing requirements, changing specifications. What do we want the telescope to do? How far do we want to see? And, and if you go from a, I mentioned this earlier, if you go from a four meter telescope to a six and a half meter telescope, when I say telescope, I'm talking about the size of the mirror that actually reflects onto another mirror and then the sensors. You, it, when you change something that, that is this precise, this much, it really has an impact on cost and schedule. In 2011, we had an independent review. We set a new baseline. And that new baseline actually had us launching in 2019. Um, and we got, again, we got all the way to the five-yard line. And when we integrated the spacecraft element with um, the optical telescope element and did testing, we made all kinds of discoveries that were unfortunate, and not just unfortunate, problematic. Um, and that's, that's where we are today. Um, so what we have to do now is, as, as um, uh, Mr. Young has noted, we're going back and we're, we're going to make sure because the way this telescope is going to be launched 
You know, it's going to be a million miles away from Earth. Uh, we don't have any human spacecraft capability that can get up there to service it, and if we could, this telescope is too delicate to even service. That being said, we have to get it right the first time. Um, th so that's why we, we go through such extensive testing. Some of the testing, ultimately, we, we discovered things that are routine, is th which is why you test. Um, some of the testing demonstrated that we, in fact, have some embedded errors and some human errors, uh, embedded problems and human errors, some embedded problems going back a number of years. Uh, Mr. Young mentioned that the thrusters were washed with the wrong solvent and that corroded some seals. That was done years ago, and we only discovered in testing that that had happened. Um, again, this is why we test. We want to make these mistakes here on Earth because that mistake, if it was in space, uh, it would be too late. It can't be fixed. So some of it is routine testing that ultimately we we're making discoveries that we need to make discoveries on, and others were finding errors that occurred years ago. And some of those errors include, um, you know, the, the using the wrong solvent to watch the, wash the thrusters, which is why we're going through right now, and we are starting from a baseline and saying, if we have to find every embedded error, we have to go back to the very beginning of every component on the spacecraft and make sure we haven't made any errors, which is what we're doing, because there's no room for failure once, once it's in space. And that's what we're doing. Mission success is the primary objective. I believe that we're there, um, and, and here we are um, requesting an extra $800 million in a, in a few more years, and I think we can get it done. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, um, I appreciate that we're under a new administration and that you're new, and so you have to take what was given you. Um, I just, again, want to express my frustration that we're talking about taxpayer dollars, and, and it, it, it's very frustrating to me and other taxpayers that this is so much of a cost overrun, um, and although I've heard testimony how important it is, I understand that. Very frustrating. I think we need to do a better job of making sure that we're not so far off the mark. Thank you. And I yes, yield back my time. And thank you, Ms. Lesko. And the gentleman from California, Mr. Ticano, is recognized. Um, welcome back, Administrator Bryson-Sight. Thank you, sir. You. Um, and congratulations. <coughs> I didn't get to say that to you earlier. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Mr. Young, for being here. Um, Mr. Uh, Administrator, can you, you just mentioned $800 million figure. Um, that, is that for fiscal year 2020 and fiscal year 2021? It gets us through launch, which would be um, through March 30th of 2021, which is the new launch date. So March, so um, you have enough money for fiscal year 2019. We do. Current. That's and, correct. And so this supplemental that you're asking for uh, is for the year 2021. 20, uh, it's really, uh, we're not really asking for a supplemental, although if you'd like to give it to us, we'll take it. Okay. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, what the law requires is, is that um, if, we, if we hit $800 billion, or $8 billion, gosh dang, I'm so 800 million. 800. <laughs> but if we hit $8 billion, um, the program is no longer authorized. And so ultimately, in the development, we, we, we haven't hit it yet, but we will soon hit $8 billion, and we'll need Congress to reauthorize it if we're going to continue. So you're asking for an authorization of, of an correct. additional $800 million yes, uh, for the program. Yes. Uh, and, and, and that money could come from NASA, or if you want to appropriate additional, it could, it could come from there as well. You know, I... We, we may have to do that. I might prefer not having to choose between our children. I mean, uh, I, know, I know, right? Um, and it's, but we have hard choices to make here. Um, so, eight hundred million. Um, uh, let's see. A question I wanted to ask. Oh, yeah, administrator. Um, given that we're moving the launch date, um, have you hired graduate students? Um, and plan for graduate student work based on the October 18th launch date? Uh, the, uh, the March 30th launch date of 2021, have we hired graduates? Well, no, I mean, because given that you've... Oh, 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 I... Already, I mean, I'm wondering what the... If you so, did hire graduate students based on the old the launch old date, launch. 
So, um, I mean, is, what is, can you tell me what's going on with that? So uh, the, the launch is actually being provided by the European Space Agency on an Ariane 5. So um, they are our international partner on this particular project. Uh, and so, to my knowledge, we, we haven't hired any graduate students to help us with the launch. It's, it's, uh, it's being provided by the European Space Agency. All right, you might just want to check up and I will. on that detail, because uh, if we've hired graduate students, I mean, um, and right. based on on the launch, but, but maybe you've delayed uh, doing that because you were uncertain about um, uh, about when you were going to be able to launch. Right. Um, how many cost overrun proposals has Northrop submitted to NASA since the original uh, JSWT replan agreement in 2011? Do you know that? I don't know offhand, um, but uh, if you could get that, yeah, I will. If you could get, get to that, a, get that to my office, that for the record. Um, yeah, and if you could also uh, get me a total on the value of uh, the cost overrun proposals uh, and whether they included any uh, award fees. I will. Yeah, that, that'd be helpful for me to know. Um, you know, I want to go back to the workforce training issues that were kind of gone over by, uh, I think, Mr. Holkren and uh, uh, Mr. Lamb. Um, you, you, you spoke about the uh, unique workforce that you have and the interns and the programs, um, and you're worried about the aging out of uh, the current workforce. Yes. Uh, and it's a pretty specialized workforce. Uh, uh, can you, is, uh, what can Congress do to support opportunities uh, for relevant workforce training experience beyond what it has now. That's a we, one. Can we do more? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for asking because I'll be sure to <laughs> sure to let you know that the, the one thing that we have been talking about a lot at NASA is um, the competition that exists today that might not have existed for NASA centers even uh, maybe you know 20 or 30 years ago. So if if you're a young person in Houston, Texas, um, there's, you know, an amazing energy industry down there that is trying to gobble up all of the electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, chemical engineers. If you're a, a young person out in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, where Ames Research Center is, there's um, all of the tech companies that are uh, gobbling up those, those, those types of talents. Um, and so it's, it's uh, the challenge that NASA has is ultimately the, the way a young person can get a job with NASA is to apply online. And in the, in the six months that follow, you may or may not get a response, let alone get a job. And, and this is a challenge that we need to, there, there is a challenge in the so way. So there's a personnel office problem, uh, inefficiencies there. They can't, uh, the applications are kind of stuck, is what you're telling me. Well, that's a piece of it. But there's also a piece of it that, that there, there's a body of law that we have to follow in order to hire somebody. And a lot of our competitors for that talent, uh, private companies, they can go to a job fair and hire somebody on the spot. And it's not, you know, when, when I say we're competing, we're not competing against the people that supply services to us necessarily. We're competing against entire other industries um, for, for that talent. And so when they can hire on the spot, and, and, and when we hire, we have to go through this elaborate process, um, we, lose, we lose a lot of talent. So direct hire authority is something that we, that we would love to have. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry for going over, but I, I think this is a rich topic, and I hope we can maybe explore this topic more with more hearings about. We will. I know we've done some stuff on workforce development, but I've heard a statistic that Mexico is producing more mechanical engineers than we are in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so I think well, I, this is a broader topic, and I hope we can devote more time to it later. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Takano. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Weber, is recognized for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To paraphrase JFK, we choose to take risks not because they're known or easy, but because they're unknown and they're hard. So you just answered the question. I had a director or Mr. Bridenstine, and welcome back, by the way. We, Thank you. We kind of missed the days you sat up here and we could make snide remarks about <laughs> some of the other members. Now you're making them about me. I know. Did I say that out loud? Um, I'm encouraged to hear that uh, it's important that we lead in space. Uh, Dr. Badman had a conversation, I forget with which one of you it was, about uh, the fact that we were cost overrunning behind schedule, was that hurting us um, with national security and with the industrial base? And I would argue exactly the opposite, that it's actually helping us. And when you said there's 90 agent countries who are ready to help with us, I was so encouraged by that because it shows the world that we are determined 
to be the space leader. And we're going to do it come hell or high water, if that applies to that amount of water we found <laughs> here the other day. So thank you for saying that. I'm encouraged by that, Jim. Uh, Mr. Young, in the IGR report, you made, was it 32 recommendations? Yes, sir. 307 failure areas, is that what I understand? Um, and then you said all, and I'm quoting, all of us need to focus on maximizing the program, okay, end quote. Who does that for those 32 failure areas and for those, th uh, th I'm, I'm sorry, 32 recommendations and 307 failure areas? Do you make recommendations about who actually takes that responsibility? I think it's pretty clear uh, for each of those who has a responsibility. We, we, the, our particular activity was chaired by the, uh, well, excuse me, was established by the Associate Administrator of, uh, of Space Science. And so that, in essence, is where our report went. But we, we did report directly to the administrator. And, uh, and we did highlight some areas where we wanted to get special attention. So some are aimed towards north of Grumman. Some are named, aimed towards uh, NASA Goddard. And some are aimed towards NASA headquarters. So the answer is there, there are very specific um, indicators as to who should be responsible for each and who should be necessarily respond to each. Well, that's what I want to hear, the famous, you know, example about Edison on the light bulb. And when somebody said, you, you know, you failed a thousand times, you know, doesn't that discourage you? So what are you talking about? We're a thousand times closer. Yeah. So if we're learning from this, if we're going to use this to our benefit and show the world that we can do this, I think it's a good thing. Uh, Administrator Ryan Stone, we'll come back to you. You named uh, categories of missions in earlier comments. You said strategic, flagship, and well, just different sizes of missions. Just different sizes of missions. Okay. So, so the idea being that for smaller missions, there's a lot less risk because there's a lot less. It, we, it's not as complicated. We don't spend as much money, um, and if there's a failure, it's one failure of say, you know, eight different small missions. But for a flag flagship mission or a strategic mission, it's huge. It's yeah, it's it's a big impact. Right. Are, are are you able to give us a percentage of those three categories, if you will? How much is in each category? Well, given where we are with James Webb, that's by far the largest category at sure. this point. So I, I've been there to see it, by the way. Yeah, that's good. That's yeah, good. it's uh, it's impressive. Um, so the, but I can get you a breakdown, a, a very specific breakdown of, of missions and costs. Right. And then, uh, Mr. Young, back to you, you made a comment earlier about the contractors who bid the lowest, uh, what did you call it? Lowest, there was a credible cost. lowest credible cost. How do we fix that? Well, you know, c contractors are going to do, you know, what you would expect, and that is they're going to um, bid in accordance to what they think it will be the determining factor in them winning the contract. So, so, so do so, you need authorization or, or change in the law from Congress on how the bidding process works? I, I personally don't think so. I mean, I think it is much more the contracting organization establishing criteria uh, for uh, who wins a contract to be consistent with the, what the particular contracting organization wants to get from the contractors. But people, the contractors, you know, are, are very capable in figuring out what is the criteria that will maximize their chance of winning, and they're going to function. They're going to perform in that particular manner, and the contracting organization has to change it such that the criteria are such that it gets the performance that they want in the bids that they get. And my personal belief is there's adequate uh, law and legislation to allow that to happen today. Okay. Well, I, it, Mr. Bryanston, you want to weigh in on that? Well, just that um, it, it is important for NASA's, uh, when, when you think about the, the, the way we do contracting, and we have, you know, uh, <coughs> contracting officer representatives, we have contractors, and, 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 um, and then we have program managers and project managers. Uh, when we go through a contract, it is critically important that NASA be every bit as smart on the capabilities and the requirements and uh, as, as, as the contractor that we are buying from. We have to be smarter than the people we are buying from to know whether or not what they are telling us is accurate and can be accomplished. There's a Latin term for that. <laughs> Caveat. 
Okay. Mtor. Okay. Okay. Buyer beware, I think it is. But look, sure. thank you. You you guys are doing great, and we appreciate your commitment. And uh, it's short of sounding a little hokey, I think you're helping to continuing to make America great again. Always have. We appreciate NASA. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair now turns to the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter, for five minutes. Thank you. 2033. <laughs> gentlemen, thank you for your testimony. Um, obviously, what did I? Everybody's leaving. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Anyway, um, just no, obviously, thank you for your testimony. I have confidence in both of you and in your review of something that really is, you know, disappointing in a lot of respects. But obviously, um, this is new territory that's being broken. There are some contractual things, and, and Mr. Young, I want to talk to you about them in a second. But if you have confidence, and I think there's a specific question came from Mr. Lipinski to you. Tom, that, you know, can this get done in this time frame that's been set for $800 million and you have confidence that it can? That's good enough for me, honestly. Let me just ask you some basic questions because there's some contractual stuff in here that I think really are good learning tools for, the, for you at NASA, for the industry generally. And, and Mr. Bridenstine, you talked about it. So my dad was in the construction business. All right, he said it was always easiest to fix a problem at the blueprint stage before you built the building. And in yours, you got an added complexity, which is the design phase, the construction phase, and then it's a million miles out there phase. So we're in the sort of the construction phase where you can fix it here and not a million miles away. And it's a much better use of our money to do it here. Um, in this process, Mr. Young, in this next two or three years, is there, see, I think one of the things that happened here, you, there was a critical path of some sort that was used, and you had vendors, Northrop Grumman was the general contractor, had vendors to it, and then now, now we're at the integration stage. Could there have been something different in terms of the critical path that would have allowed us to see these mistakes, which we know can happen when people are putting the screws in. Is there a different way to do this critical path? Could we have integrated this thing earlier? That's my first question. Um, <clears throat> it's a good question. Let me touch on two, two, two aspects of it. Relative to embedded problems, you know, that are discovered late, later. You know, the, the, the technique that we utilize to make sure that they don't happen is to really go through a progressive test program. And so what it really says is that if you have a piece of hardware and you start out with it, you test it as a standalone item. And, and so you know the, I'll call it the pedigree again, or the quality of that hardware all the way through. And so if you get to the particular point that you've installed that on a spacecraft before you have gone through each of these steps, you have made yourself vulnerable to an embedded problem uh, being there that has a much larger implication. I've got to really say that we did not go back through and trace the history you know, of each, each of these items because what we were trying to do is assess where we are today and what do we have to do to get to a successful a completion? I, I guess what I'd like process. you to do, though, is when you guys are doing sort of an after, you know, project it kind needs, of analysis, look at the critical done. path piece of it this thing. It needs to be done. And, and, it, and typically, if you walk through that process that you're asking about, which is probably no different than the construction process, by the way, uh, I, I would argue, if each step of the way you know the quality of that particular hardware, then you are pretty confident that you have not moved too far to the right with an embedded problem without, dis without discovering it. So that's the process of doing it. And I do think you raise a really good point. As a lesson learned, it would probably be a good thing to take all of these and go back and look at how the step-by-step -step test program was, uh, was, was implemented. Thank you. I'm going to um, change the subject just a little bit. So. 
I feel like we have three opportunity costs kind of lost here. One is the billion dollars or $800 million, um, which, you know, I'm, I'm reading something today says that uh, the majority party, the Republicans, are thinking of another $600 billion tax cut on top of the $1.5 or $1,500 billion tax cut. We could, we could fix this problem a lot with that revenue that we are foregoing. But I think the two issues that I'm particularly concerned about are the lost science and the reallocation of assets away from other projects that NASA may have. If we were to uh, authorize and appropriate another $800 million, could you keep those other projects on time or keep them going? Gentlemen's time has expired. The witness may answer the question, though. Uh, the, the answer is, I, the, yes, sir, we absolutely could. I would also argue um, that uh, some of those projects haven't even been started yet. So we, we would, we would in, in essence, start new projects that otherwise wouldn't get started if we didn't have the additional money. Okay, thank you. And Chair I yield back. Thanks, Mr. Gentleman Chair. yields back. The chair now turns to the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Higgins, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I support this program and the completion of this crucial project. I believe the money should come from offsets in other areas. Um, like my colleagues, I voiced my concern regarding the cost overruns and scheduled delays, but these guys are doing something that's never been done before. And although all Americans recall the infamous bridge to nowhere, the 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 endeavor we're speaking of today, Mr. Chairman, is a bridge to everywhere. So I concur with my colleagues that believe that the United States should be number one on Earth, and thus we must be number one in space. And as a, a Christian principled man, it's uh, fascinating to me to observe as science begins to come to grips with let there be light. And this is the mission that could, that could bring us to a new, a new level of understanding never dreamed of before. Mr. Bridenstein, thank you for your service, sir. The Independent Review Board recommends that NASA and Northrop Grumman Aerospace Systems should take a number of actions to address human errors during the integration and testing phase to prevent or at the very least detect embedded problems before they affect the project schedule. It's important for you to explain. Please elaborate on what actions NASA has taken to ensure that, that Northrop Grumman is properly implementing the recommendations that the Independent Review Board uh, suggested to ensure that human error and embedded problems will not continue. So uh, one of the reasons that we um, have extended the, the, the time of the program is ultimately to go back and look at uh, all of the components that go into the entire spacecraft from, from the beginning, um, and ultimately to determine whether or not there are other embedded problems, like the issue we had with the fasteners, like the issue we had with using the wrong solvent to, to clean the thrusters. Are there any other, other of those issues that might have been accomplished years ago that ultimately um, could end up revealing themselves in space? And what we want to do is make sure we'll that fix that on the on the ground. That's, fix it on the ground. Understood. So you so you're very focused on the 32 recommendations that have been that have been concluded by the review board. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And uh, for the record, Mr. Young, in regard to NASA and Northrop Grumman's plan for implementing your 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 board's recommendations, how soon do you recommend a review of those implementation plans? That's really a good question. Um, I, I actually, and, and it's a decision for NASA to, to decide, you know, when they want that to be done. My personal judgment is that in the next couple of months, the, um, the, the course is going to be set for JWST and, and hopefully the success. Of the Mr. Bridenstine seems to be a very animated and, and, and sincere about following your recommendations. Can you provide for this committee, sir? Uh, in writing a, a recommendation, would, would you believe should be a, a time frame for, for a review of those implementations? It's in 90 days or whatever you believe it would be. Mr. Young, can you provide that? Yes, yes and Mr. Sir. Bridenstine, will you provide that as well, that you'll concur with that? A absolutely. In fact, okay, let, me, uh, let me jump forward. This, 
these, these cost overruns, they, uh, they predate my service at the congressional level. They predate your service uh, for NASA, sir. So we're just living with what we have. But we have to finish this thing. And it, it's fascinating, as you're pointing out, that the largest uh, issues you're, you're, you're dealing with is a never-before-designed spaceship. Now, had that spaceship been designed prior, would, 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 would we have eliminated a lot of the problems that we've encountered with cost overruns? Absolutely. So is it not reasonable to, to conclude that future NASA projects and future space exploration projects will certainly draw upon the knowledge that you all are frontiering right now and pioneering engineering regarding uh, heat shields in this particular type of spacecraft? Is it not reasonable to conclude that the work you're doing now and the treasure we're investing now, Mr. Chairman, will benefit future projects and future generations of all mankind. A absolutely. We have bought down a ton of risk through this process. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses. I, as um, someone who's actually managed uh, not multi-billion but multi-million dollar uh, technical projects uh, for the government, um, you know, I, I probably stayed up way too late last night reading uh, the, I guess, 69 pages of your um, independent review um, report, and I was uh, quite impressed uh, with, you know, the you know, the top line uh, recommendations you made. Um, and there are a couple of concerns with the NASA's plan for, for dealing with some of them. Um, but uh, let's see, first, uh, uh, Mr. Brandstein, you emphasize that there is now the ability for uh, more people to say stop when they see a technical thing. Did anyone for the two, um, for the two major difficulties you've had, the, um, either the thruster solvent problem or the sun shield covers, did anyone at any point uh, say stop and was shouted down? Um, as far as the thrusters go, uh, the, the, my understanding is the technician, and this was years ago, the technician ultimately did ask for uh, permission to use a specific sol solvent and was given the go-ahead by Mission Assurance. Now, um, that was a mistake that was made a couple of years ago and right. in testing. But, but it was not an instance, you know, like the, I don't know, the shuttle O-ring uh, situation. No. Where, where, uh, where engineers got overruled. Um, and now on the other one, the, which was, I think, a secondary problem uh, with the redesign of the fastener attachment plate uh, with concerns about snagging and, um, and so a redesign of, the, of which uh, nuts and bolts would be used. Um, and so was that, I guess this is for Mr. Young, was that um, under configuration control uh, when someone changed the design of how those attachments would be made? And what, was there a, a traceable signature um, authority when that design change was made? Or was this something where a technician sort of said, okay, yeah, maybe we should use a different kind of nut and bolt on this? We, we did not go through all the paper, so I want to be clear about that, but my assumption is it was under configuration control, and there was a procedure that was uh, written and established by Northrop Grumman that was implemented by the, by the subcontractor in, um, uh, in installing them. So there was a change process. The change was documented. The change was incorporated in a procedure and that procedure was provided to the subcontractor as to how the screws and nuts should be installed. Yes. Okay, um, so if, if you could get, actually, as a follow-up, um, you know, the actual change control, uh, you know, response, what the formalities of that actually were for this change that went in, because I think, you know, simple thing like having a nylon insert in the bolt would have been, um, probably changed the project history a little bit. Um, now, in, to the big picture, the, the cost overrun, which in aggregate has been roughly tripling. Um, you know, when I'm painfully familiar with a similar thing in, you know, for the superconducting super collider in high energy physics where the cost roughly doubled and eventually resulted in the cancellation, uh, you know, when you looked in retrospect at the cost growth, it was almost entirely attributable to a decision that was made by the Department of Energy to task essentially a military contractor to uh, reproduce a laboratory in a place in a greenfield site uh, with completely unrealistic cost estimates for that. And so um, if you look at the 
um, at the cost growth. Uh, this was a project that was split between uh, you know, Goddard and, um, and Northrop Grumman, um, and as well as, I guess, the launch, uh, the launch uh, facilities. Um, it, can you make generalities about where most of the cost growth occurred? Because there may be lessons learned about when you split projects, um, there may be better ways to do that split. As either Mr. Young, I guess, well, you, I guess, <laughs> it's a hot potato, okay. <laughs> so the, 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 I think originally the cost growth came from the idea that we changed requirements. We wanted to see further, uh, we wanted to see further back in time, which required us to go with a, a larger mirror. And when that determination was made, um, the, the cost really went up very, very fast. And we, and we made a, a, a decision, when I say we, it was NASA, um, back in you know the mid 2000s, uh, made a decision to go with a much bigger, uh, more intricate kind of. Uh, so that was a that was a high level decision. But in terms of the execution of the project, independent of that, um, you know, are there any generalities that can be made about uh, the circumstances under which you know did most of the cost growth happen in one area or another? You know, in the scientific instrument package versus the 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 bus the and so on, or, or just the schedule slippage? I think the, the, the number one thing was just excessive optimism from the beginning. Uh, we didn't know what we didn't know, and we believed that uh, a lot of these um, you know, very new technologies could be developed at a much lesser cost and with a lot less time. Um, and as we went through the process, we discovered that there's a lot to be developed that we didn't understand, um, and, and of course, we have learned from that. Yeah, well, I, I'm, you know, one of your, end of your report uh, highlights these reporting gaps that happened very often, you know, between uh, Goddard and, um, uh, and Northrop Grumman, and I would just wonder if there are lessons to be learned. Do, do future projects like WFIRST have that same uh, sort of, you know, split responsibility between a uh, contractor and uh, a NASA, uh, so NASA lab? So WFIRST is... Um ultimately a, a mission that is far less complex uh, than what we have with the James Webb Space Telescope. So but does it have the same split reporting problems that were highlighted? General, time has expired, but the witnesses may answer the question. It, 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 the, the organizational change that we've made on James Webb Space Telescope ultimately will apply to W first. I, th I think the other comment to make is I, I don't the split's not unusual. In other words, it, it's common practice for NASA to have a prime contractor. So um, I, th I think NASA has an overarching responsibility of, you know, for the total program, the prime contractor has responsibility for executing their contract. And, um, and I don't think that's at all unusual. And I think it's, you know, it, it will be the way that many programs go forward in the, in the future. And then what it really says is that you know, we do know how and we need to implement both on JWST and future missions a communications mechanism uh, that is recognizing that that's the way we actually execute and implement projects. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, we've had a lot of talk about the prospects of a successful project and looking back and looking forward. I'm going to do that right now on the project um, because I, I, you know, I appreciate all the rah-rah that's going on here, but it really is not, in my opinion, the purpose of the hearing is to try to determine what happened and how we can prevent this from happening in the future. So, uh, Administ Administrator uh, Bridenstine, I'm going to ask you this, and, and Mr. Young, you can jump in, but I don't want long answers because I've got a lot of questions, and, and if I have to, I'll stick around and do a second round. But uh, who was responsible for the design on the front end? Was that NASA or, or Northrop? NASA. Okay. Who was responsible for the estimating on the on the cost side? Uh, we receive proposals and then we make determinations based on those proposals. So you had a combination of NASA doing the design, uh, Northrop Grumman ev evaluating the design, presenting a proposal that that told you five hundred million dollars. We we ultimately NASA is responsible for generating the requirements and uh, the specifications. Did anyone take into account the feasibility of the project at the time to determine first of all was the project feasible and was the cost in line with with the feasibility of the project? Yes. And and but you still took. Uh, it's it's 2018, 22 years later, you still don't have it done, and it's 19 times the initial estimate. 
How is that possible? Uh, again, uh, going back in time, the specifications changed. We determined. I understand that. Sure. But, you know, I worked for two international engineering companies before I started the think tank, and, and we used to joke at one of them in particular that there's never time to do it right, but there's always time to do it over. That's bad for everybody. And when you do a cost plus contract and somebody else is paying the cost, the taxpayers, it, it, I just see it time and time again, whether it's military contracts, whether it's NASA, that, that there are a number of things that happen. They get concerned that they won't get the funding from Congress, so they start a project before it's ripe. And then you have cost overruns. There's a NASA project right now, I think, that, that within six or eight months, it was 50% cost overrun. And then you have things like this. So initial estimate was $500 million. You're, you're, with the launch cost, you're going to uh, uh, be at, what, $9.6 billion? That's uh, life cycle cost. Life cycle cost. And I just have to wonder if, if we'd gone ahead and built the project to the initial specifications and launched it, how much would we have learned from that launch that could have been applied to a second generation, a third generation? You're absolutely right. That's a, that's a wonderful point. I, I agree completely. Well, that, that's the kind of stuff that drives me crazy. Yeah. I mean, we're looking right now at a $21.5 trillion debt, and, and if we have another project that takes 20 years to complete, it won't get completed because we can't afford it, we'll be bankrupt. And we keep doing stuff like this, and we don't hold people accountable for doing it. The committee doesn't exercise the proper oversight. I'm sitting here wondering, after 22 years, Mr. Chairman, where, where's the oversight? And where was the effort to hold anybody accountable for this? And, and this goes on and on and on. I think what you're, you're, we're trying to accomplish here is breathtaking in its scope. But we can't continue to operate like this. I mean, we, somebody at some point should have had some oversight over this, and, 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 and maybe we would have launched this 10 years ago, and we would have learned an enormous amount from it so that the money we're spending now really would have had a, a magnificent return but we're, we haven't gotten off the ground. So that, um, that, that's the kind of stuff that I think we've got to deal with. For NASA to be able to achieve its mission, accomplish the objectives that, that, that NASA has set for itself, we have got to, to rethink how we do these contracts. I'm not a big proponent of cost plus at all. I, I think uh, if, we, if we did these things where we, we fund it up front, at the design phase and at a certain percent at the next phase of construction, then you, you do the review, you correct the mistakes, and then you launch and you, and you pay off after launch. I think we'd, we'd see things that cost a whole lot less and we'd see things get off the ground a whole lot quicker. So how, how do you want to respond to that as the new administrator? Well, I, I, would, I would say that the, the, the fundamental question is um, would we do it again? And I, I, would, I would say that uh, not this way, we would not. Uh, the question is, will it be worth it in the end? And we don't have an answer for that right now, but I believe it will be. Well, I, I sat here and listened to you uh, uh, talk about um, your hopes, your visions for, for this project and NASA, and, and I uh, heard one of our Democrat colleagues comment on um, uh, you as the administrator, and I just happen, I, I wonder why it took so long to confirm you. I appreciate what you're trying to do, and, and I want you to know that if there's any help that I can provide to you, I think I can speak for the committee as well, that we can uh, provide to you, particularly in avoiding uh, other project mishaps like we've had with this. I think uh, we would be more than happy to assist in any way we can. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back, and before I turn to the gentleman from New York, I'd simply note to him, I'm after you, so you're not last, sir. <laughs> okay. Chair, recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko, for five minutes. Thank you. I thank the chair and the ranking member for the uh, opportunity. Uh, personally, I was inspired by the years leading up to the moon landing. Uh, I was in high school as we competed in the space race against the Soviet Union uh, for space flight supremacy. We had a patient, passionate resolve to use science and engineering to beat our rivals, and after years of investing and innovating, America led the world in this endeavor, and our nation was the first to land on the moon. The memories from that day forever linger uh, in, in my mind. It inspired me to believe that with the will and necessary resources, America would lead the way in continued exploration, research, and development. It also inspired me to embrace an education in science and engineering. 
So I am excited by the James Webb Space Telescope, and even more so excited by the potential impact this work and related discoveries can have on engaging the public and inspiring our next generation of scientists and engineers. We should continue discussions on how to ensure mission success and how to do this the right way, even if it takes longer than we would have liked. On a different note, though, I would like to hear more on how NASA is utilizing Webb to engage the public and to build our next generation of scientists and engineers. I've told students in the capital region of New York that I represent that through STEM, you can be the scientist who learns new secrets about our universe. You can be that astronaut who lands on Mars, or you can be that doctor or researcher who discovers the path to better ensure health, a healthy passage on long space flights, or you can be the engineer who designs or invents a new technology or the spaceship that will take us far past our own galaxy. So Administrator Bridenstein, what is NASA working on to engage the public on the inspirational undertaking? That's a, a, a wonderful question, Congressman Tonko, and important because uh, NASA is the one agency, I believe, in the U.S. government more than any others that can inspire that next generation, of you, as you've so correctly identified. And to have an investment like this and not take advantage of it to accomplish that, I think, would be a massive mistake. So um, what we do with James Webb is critically important for that. Um, one of the first things that we're going to do is, is uh, it's, it's the, the, the data and the information and the science that we receive from James Webb is going to be made available to the entire world, and it's going to be made available for free. We want people to know and understand what we're discovering um, and let them take the data and the information and make discoveries of their own, which uh, we believe all around the world people will have the opportunity to do. Um, it's also true that we want to engage the public, as you've correctly identified, um, by having people come up with ideas on how to utilize the James Webb Space Telescope in, in, in ways that we're not even thinking about right now. What are, what are the scientific inquiries that um, others all around the world have? And we're seeing right now an interest from nations all over the world with their universities and their scientists um, making recommendations to NASA, and of course we're, we're compiling a lot of recommendations. There's more, uh, more requests for utilization than there is ability to utilize, um, which is a good problem to have. Um, and so it, I think it will provide a source of ins inspiration from around the world, but more than, than any of that, just like we've seen with the Hubble, um, taking the new science that we learn and rewriting textbooks Mm -hmm. um, is 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 game changing, uh, and uh, so it will have. Again, we're we're rewriting science textbooks. That's that's what NASA does, and that's what this will be. And that in itself um, is going to engage the public in ways that right now we don't we don't even understand. So. Are there? And I appreciate that, and I I think that's a, a good uh, outcome. Um, is there, are there other specific things that NASA is doing to communicate and involve our students? Uh, certainly, um, NASA has a number of different programs that get universities involved and, and get uh, children involved. Um, and, and, and yes, so that, you know, we have an Office of Education, for example. We have an Office of, of Communications, and um, we're very active on social media. We have millions and millions of people that follow us, and every new discovery that we make, we're, we're communicating it out to the public and, and trying to inspire that next, um, you know, the, the seven-year-old to become the next you know, Neil Armstrong. We're, we're doing that all the time. Well, I think the, um, the efforts here to engage the public and to uh, pull the students into uh, technical fields um, are so critically important to the, uh, the future of this country. Uh, and to uh, be able to do that through the uh, auspices of NASA, I think, is an incredible thing. So I thank you for the leadership, and uh, I wish us all well with the, uh, uh, the final uh, outcomes here as we go forward and uh, learn from our mistakes and build for a stronger future. Thank so you. with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back, and uh, thanks for allowing me to be next to last. Absolutely, my dear friend. Thank you for yielding back. I recognize myself for five minutes and just simply to offer an observation and a question. It's good, uh, Administrator Bridenstine, my old fellow Oklahoma colleague, to be here. Uh, you enter into your role in a challenging time. Perhaps not since uh, Administrator Webb have there been such opportunities and such challenges for the agency. I'm about 18 months younger than NASA, so my entire life 
NASA's been, the, as my mother used to say, a child of the 1930s. It's been the Buck Rogers Institution. It's been the whiz-bang of, of the federal government and the world. But as we enter into these ever-increasingly large and expensive science projects, the expectations uh, and the anticipation of the constituents grow. Your legacy, I suspect, will be determined by how well you, working with all of the wonderful people at NASA and all the contractors, deliver on, or deliver on finishing James Webb. That's right. I have expectations that you can do that. My only question, quite simply, to you is, as we've discussed now at extent, not through this hearing, but through hearings and hearings and hearings on James Webb, this has to be right. We can't go put a pair of glasses on it the way we did Hubble. We can't go make adjustments. It has to fly correctly. Your word is, and I'm asking, it, we won't fly until we're ready. We won't fly until we're perfect. And when we're perfect, we'll live up to the expectations that uh, we've established in this committee and in this country for this project, correct? That's correct. That's all I have to ask, and that's the reassurance I need. With that, I thank the witnesses for their testimony and the members for their questions. The committee stands in uh, recess until tomorrow morning, at which time we'll reconvene for the continuation of this hearing.